We um, we have the great Judd Apatow here now. Judd, let's start this off. Do you have an opinion on Brendan's shirt? Because well, it has uh, you know paint uh, <laughs> like Jackson Pollock paint on it. How yeah. do you know I didn't go? I wasn't painting before this. We know. I'm an artist. Yeah, I'm an artist. <laughs> so. If you were an artist, you'd be a bad artist because there's just too much paint on your shirt. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're a sloppy painter. <laughs> but you know that's fashion. See, I I don't understand fashion. About two or three years ago, I said. I look weird and everything. I can't decide what my fashion is. I'm not like Euro trash guy. I'm not like preppy guy. So I just, someone gave me a James Purse polo shirt. I said, I'm just going to wear that. And I wear a James Purse polo shirt literally 95%. Yes. Of the time. I've just decided to. I'm wearing one right now. This, this is James yeah. Purse. I feel like that's the move for like for older guys like dudes. Me. Yeah. For like, or people aren't into fashion. It's like jeans, yes. solid color. He makes jeans, fun of me all the time. Color. He bought me these boots. I, he bought these yes. for me for my birthday. Just to give you some style. For my 50th. Yeah, and uh, I wear James Purse yeah. in jeans. I can't, I can't figure it out, and so I've just given up completely. You know, I remember I, you know, I met Wes Anderson when he was really young and mm. he first moved to town. And then at some point he just started dressing well. <laughs> it just showed That's up. That's weird. <laughs> and, and, you know, he was just, a, you know, a, you know a, a struggling filmmaker. Then he decided, okay, this is what I look like. I'm gonna, and he made a choice and he looks amazing. Yeah. He's like, I'm like, you know, a Tom Wolf guy or whatever. And I just never could figure out what the what the move was. You need a stylist. Does he? Did he hire? See, that's a bad idea. Really? See, I was just I was gonna say, does he have a stylist? Because I feel like yeah. guys that hire stylists, so stylists go, well, this is what's in right now. You should be wearing this. Like right. I don't. That's not. I, I think I he has a sense of it. I have no sense of it. I never did. Me neither. You know. Also, I'm always in slightly bad shape, so clothes never look <laughs> right on me. I'm always 50 just pounds. I'm right. always in slightly bad shape. You know. You know. It's just enough to make every shirt look wrong because there's nothing worse than like a little gut. You know. That's just enough to <laughs> ruin like go, everything. I call that a fupa. Exactly. You either go full gut where it's cool or yeah. little guts. Not when, cool, it, when bigger, at least it's a statement. Yeah. You, know, you could uh, well, pull Servino it a little bit. Yeah. But it's 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 the little guy. And so there was this article about dad bods. And my friend sent it to me. He's like, you should read this article about dad bods, which is guys who have like kind of a shitty body, like slightly <laughs> shitty. And slightly I, shitty. I clicked on the link, and there was a photo. And I swear to God, the photo was of me. It, <laughs> no. You can look it up. It's an Atlantic <laughs> Monthly. It was actually really? of you? Was, I was like the representation no. of the dad bod. <laughs> oh, and, fuck. Oh, <laughs> fuck. Oh, Jesus. And so I've been trying to lose weight. Because I'm, you know, I'm taping a Netflix special at the end of July in Montreal. Nice. So I'll be there, so well, I'm going to come see you. Oh, that's just for laughs there? Yeah, yeah, so everyone in Montreal should come uh, see me. I'm going to be at the end of July. I'm going to be at the Wilbur. Uh, i got to get my plugs out of the way just because yeah. literally Do no it, one man. wants to that's come to see me. Uh, plug but, the shit out of it. I think it's the, the, the 24th. I'm at the Wilbur in Boston. I'm at Ridgefield, Connecticut. I think it's the 23rd. I might be off by a day. But uh, Ridgefield, Connecticut, and then also in Providence, Rhode Island. Okay, where, whereabouts in Rock Province? I think, is it the Columbus? Theater? It's Judd Apatow. Look you it guys up. will figure it out. Yeah, you guys and, and figure it out. What's funny about watching your stand up is I, when I, I'm such a fan of your movies, but then I was watching you do stand up. This is before I knew you had done it before. Yes. And I was like, he's fucking good at stand up too? Like, what the fuck is going on? What's funny about you is that, you know, by the way, yeah, so go see Judd. The point is, he's really funny. But, but, um, the point is, he's been doing stand up longer than anyone. Yeah, he started in 1985, there. which I didn't realize when he was 17. Yeah, well, I took well, a 20, 20 year break. Yeah, but, make big time movies. But I was thinking during that time. I was just mentally getting preparing your thoughts for, together, <laughs> getting You're ready for the return. Well, that like that's what cracks me up about like you know I, I, I you've kind of been doing something that I think very so many people try to do, but you seem to keep you always put out these great movies, and I think the biggest thing about your movies is that they're you know we want to turn turn this into you've answered these questions and talked about this a fucking thousand times, but. What I like about your movies is that they're not just hilarious; they're also like they're real stories, like where mm-hmm. you follow the characters. So your your discipline as a storyteller is pretty pretty you know well honed, which is pretty amazing. But well, we try to make good movies, yeah. I, and I think some people just want to make movies; <laughs> they just want to make some money, get something green lit, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they're looking for premises. But I'm always looking for like something that someone is so passionate about. Like the people making the movie will kill for the movie. Like yeah. oh, we have a movie coming out. This Friday in New York and LA, then it comes out on July 14th around the country called The Big Sick. So Kamel Nanjiani yeah. from from Silicon Valley wrote this movie with his wife, Emily. So he comes and pitches me a couple of ideas, and some of them are just ideas for movies. Mm-hmm. But then he says, but, and then I had this experience with my wife when I first met her where you know, we weren't getting along great because my parents wanted me to have an arranged marriage. And 
This I is him talking. It's him talking, Yeesh. and I didn't know how to what to do. And he's Pakistani, right? He's Pakistani. He came yeah. here when he was eighteen, and then I so I was fighting with her about that, and then she, she gets sick one day. I go to the hospital, and they say we need to put her in a coma to try to figure out what's wrong with her. Wow. And then I wound up in a hospital for a week, hanging out with her parents, waiting for her to hopefully get better. Damn. And it's an amazing story. And this is real. And this is real. It's a crazy story. Dang. The craziest part of it is the doctor said to Kamel, are you the husband? We need you to sign this form to put her in the coma. And he said, I'm not the husband. And the doctor said, we need you to sign this form because you're the husband, right? Wow. Dang. And he signed the form and, and they intubated her and put her in a coma. Damn. But I, I guess he was saying she's going to die if someone doesn't yeah. Yeah. sign you this have form. To yes, sign. So good please Lord. lie on the form. <laughs> it's a crazy story. It's a good doctor. So we said, how do we make this movie hysterical but real at the yeah. same time? Yeah. And it took three or four years of a zillion drafts. Dang. And we got Ray Romano and Holly Hunter to play his wife's parents, mm -hmm. Zoe Kazan to play his wife. And the movie, it might be the best movie I've ever been a part of. Really? Really? It's just, it's just a gem. It's at and it took three to four years. Yeah. It, it, we're at 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. And, Jesus. and then you get to the question, how do you get people to get off their asses and go to the movie yeah, theater? Well, in course. this day and age, when you have so much so at home. So much content, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's rare to go to a movie theater and watch a movie with people and to have it kill like that experience like yeah. when you see a great movie that's hysterical and moves you and that's what this is so hopefully people will go it's a great test of if people will leave dude, their how, how your batting average is, is so high i've never i've never gone to i swear to god i'm not saying i've never gone to one of your movies where i that's why well, I had, that's i think this first thing i told you is I, I, I when i met you i was like you're, you're able to constantly write these movies and you just put out these great movies over and over again it how, seems like how weird is it sitting in a crowd the first because you i'm sure that you go through tests and all that but then sure. when it's like a premiere and you're sitting in the crowd seeing the fans reaction well the scariest is the test you know so when you finish a movie what you usually do is you know, you watch it alone with the editor and then you're you're depressed for weeks i don't care what movie it is the what, first cut you want to kill oh, okay. yourself it never is right and it always feels unfixable when mm. you first watch it then you try to fix it, and then you show whatever, 15 friends, 30 friends, get some notes. Their notes are usually semi-helpful, but usually completely different than a real crowd's notes because yeah. your friends are too smart or have seen too many movies yeah. or whatever. And then you, do, you go to a mall somewhere, then you get 300 strangers, and that's the scary one. And you find out in five minutes. Really? Five if, minutes? If they yeah. are going to go on this ride with you or not. I remember the first screening oh. of Knocked Up. I don't know why, but they found all of Seth's friends obnoxious and annoying the way we had edited them. Yeah. So it started out with Seth in bed, and we had this whole thing of he's sleeping, and Jason Siegel blows pot into his nose while he's sleeping. Yeah. And whatever, the jokes were just a little too weird or edgy, and they hated like Siegel and Jonah and Jay Baruchel and Martin Starr. And they're we, all friends too, right? They're, they're like friends, friends in real life. Because yeah. they're all from Freaks and Geeks too, a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. But at the time, people didn't know them that well. Freaks and Geeks wasn't a hit. Those They yeah. hadn't hit in movies. And then we had to sit and go, which jokes make the crowd hate them? And then God. we figured it out. It was like three jokes that were too harsh or too obnoxious. Yeah. And we plucked them, and suddenly they were the favorite part of the movie. They're hilarious. And that happens in these tests. The biggest test we ever had was was super bad because we didn't know how well it was working and the first time we showed it at some mall in Burbank it it was like a Who concert the place just they exploded crazy. Oh yeah. and we, we couldn't believe it this movie The Big Sick oddly tested higher than Superbad tested higher than Bridesmaids Damn, what? people really love this movie so I, I hope people go The Big Sick in New York and LA <clears throat> Friday and then in, in uh, two weeks around the country how but, many people have these these ideas for a movie and then they're like this is a Judd project we want Judd to do this because 40 year old virgin was that Steve was Steve, Steve Carell, Carell. Yeah. yeah great movie because di didn't he, he that I was his idea man. for the movie or he had an idea of this four-year-old virgin how it'd go down then he brought it to you or you just heard it like how's that work well it used to be really hard to get people a break to be the lead of a movie mm. it was just very hard for someone to say we're going to gamble on an unknown or generally unknown person to be the lead of the movie and my theory always 
has been that people almost prefer to see someone they don't know. but They just like the freshness of a new person. That's what I was going to ask you because it feels like the the day of the movie star opening a movie, if you look at a lot of these yeah. movies that are making it, yeah. it they, they're making a fortune with – Basically, just good actors or unknowns or people yes. that are right for the part. Just the story, right? Being- yeah, and, and all that. So so because you've got people like Johnny Depp and all these people that are not getting you a return on your investment. They're spending, they were spending so much money on these guys yeah. that they thought were is, – is that still – is that really the case? Well, it used to be that you know certain people – and there's, there still are a few that people are going to see them in anything. So you knew there was like a, a bottom that was decent. Like, you know, any Tom Cruise movie is going to make – a yeah. certain amount of money opening, right. no matter what it is. And that seems to be happening less and less. So so there's still those people, but not many of them. And I think that people like to see Amy Schumer in a movie. They like to see Camille yeah. Nanjiani in a movie. And so with Carell, we were doing Anchorman, and he was damn, doing The Weatherman, a Brick Tamlin. You did Anchorman too. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and, uh, he, and he was killing so hard, Carell. Yeah. And Adam and... Adam McKay and those guys, they, they knew him from Second City. They, they all knew how yeah. hilarious he was. Beast. But he was murdering where even the whole cast of Anchorman was like, what is happening on this set? <laughs> and so I just said to him one day, you got any ideas where you're the star of the movie? And he came to me and the next day. He's like, you know, I did a sketch at Second City about – a 40-year-old virgin, you know, and it's him at a poker game and everyone's telling sex stories <laughs> and his make no sense because clearly he hasn't had sex. And then he started doing it to me and I remember it's what he so did. Funny. He's like, you know, like when you put your hand on a, a, a woman's panties and there's all the baby powder <laughs> and you know how like a breast feels like a bag of sand and it just made me laugh and I, I instantly knew exactly what it should be because there was a way to do it where... It's real. You feel for the person. Yeah. It's not making fun that of the person. That was what was amazing about the guy. You know what else is hilarious in that movie is your wife, which is the drunk chick driving him home. Oh, yes. Yeah, she yeah, throws yeah. up. Yeah. Or well, how, about is, is, how about his heart on in the beginning of the movie where you're just like, God damn, it's so real. <laughs> it's so real. Just walking around with this giant heart on. You know what's so funny about comedy is, you know, you ever sit home and you're writing a joke. Yeah. And you get so excited with your joke that you literally stand up and run around. <laughs> like you figure out, like no one's done this yes. joke. How could no one do this joke? And for me, I'm sitting. I don't know if I was home or in the office, and I thought I've never seen someone try to piss with a boner on screen. <laughs> I've never seen that. And I ran around the house like I cured cancer. I just, I was so happy. It the was, day, it was the day. so memorable though. It was so good. And the day we shot it, I was so happy. Then you know we did some version where like the, the pee. Hits him in the face yeah, like yeah, yeah. at some point. And then we did weird outtakes where we really let him pee in his own face because he couldn't push it down far <laughs> enough. Uh, it's so stupid. But it really is those moments that make you believe in the Lord. You're yes. Like, the yes. Lord just gave me this pee with a boner joke. <laughs> it's, it's so true, man. But you seem to keep constantly doing it. This is kind of interesting, too, because um, Brendan, who was a football player, pro fighter, and then has always fantasized about being – a comedian never told mm-hmm. anybody, mm-hmm. and with all of a sudden we start doing this podcast because yes. I noticed that he was really good at telling stories. I was like, "This guy's funny." He had me and Rogan howling one time with the stories. So I was like, "Let's do a podcast." Long story short, it starts becoming this big thing, and he kind of like we're close, right? So he didn't really want to admit to me that he wanted to do stand up. Oh yeah, it's scary to admit it before you do it. Yeah, so I didn't like, admit it f- for years when I was a kid. I, I thought. There's nothing lamer than saying you want to be a stand-up before you're a stand-up. Yeah, I'd like to be a stand-up. Right. So he looks at me and he goes, um, I'm thinking about telling stories, you know? I mean, just getting up, just telling stories about fighting, and you know, just what my life, my life. And I was like, mm-hmm, interesting. I go, you want to do stand-up? He goes, I mean, I wouldn't say stand-up. And I was like, mm. And I was like, in my back of my mind, I was like, he wants to do stand-up. Long story short, he shows up with Sick in the Head, your book. Oh, wow. And he's reading... All about Judd Apatow and all about comedy, and oh, wow. uh, so this it was is helpful. Of, kind of full circle. Yeah, yeah this is weird. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, this is. And but when we were backstage at the comedy store together, and I've never met you before. I saw you back there, and I'm like, well, you know, comics always say hi to each other back there. I'm like, man, I don't want to be that weird. Oh, I respect you know, I respect you. And so I was just like, hey, man, read your book, sick in the head. It helped me out tremendously. You're like, oh, cool, man. We just started yeah. talking about that. But this is what's weird: is that sick in the head. People ask me all the time about, like, how'd you get started? What helped you? And I tell them, obviously, I, you know, Brian Cowan's been a huge help, and Rogan and Delia and the guys, Bert. But 
there's not a lot of content out there to kind of I don't know, give you kind of a, a pathway or th- or sure. how other comics are thinking or where they are in their career. And then when I got to Sick in the Head, it's interesting because you started when you were a kid. Yeah. So you're asking questions for, you know, a guy, you know, I've always been into comedy. I know comedy, but uh, you're this young kid who has all these aspirations and goals. And you're asking questions where someone who n- doesn't have their black belt in comedy, I would ask the same thing at 30. Yeah. Sure. So you read the book and the... Steve Martin, which I read his, you know, Born Standing Up, and I freaking, that book was amazing. But I, it, for me, it was tough to relate to Steve Martin. But when I'm reading your book and I'm, it's going through all these guys, like the confidence Jerry Seinfeld had, yeah. and, you know, he's showing up as a kid and he's telling them, you, he's booking it himself, and then he shows up and like, what the, this is a kid. <laughs> and everyone's pretty cool. They still yeah. let him do it. Yeah. But it, so that book really helped me to kind of, I find my way a little bit in this weird world, and trust me, I'm still trying to find it. You know how it goes. And then you're on the show today, and tonight I shoot for Comedy Central. Oh, wow. How weird is yeah. that? Well, this is what, what are happens. you shooting? What are you doing? Uh, this is not happening. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. With yeah. Ari. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Tell that's the fantastic. Story. Yeah. Well, it's, you're kind of interesting, though, because like th- the way he's saying this is like, it, you know, I have talked to people who knew you back then, and mm-hmm. they all were like, he's going to run this town. Mm-hmm. But you don't come across that way. So when you talk, when you meet people that are like that, typically they're they're just very type A. They're very kind of like, you know, you know what I mean. There's a, mm-hmm. there's a, there's a profile that fits that sort of the the guy, the director, the producer, and there's no time. And when I see you, it cracks me up. Is that not only you're very accessible and you're you know you're, you're basically like the characters you fucking write about. Let's be honest. Yes. <laughs> although although those characters aren't disciplined. Those characters are getting high all the time. You're just not that guy. There's no way you could be as successful as you are. And be that, like be. Well, thank God, I, none of that works for me ever. It never did. It never did. Right? I just would get tired. I remember I had a girlfriend uh, many, many moons ago, and we smoked pot, and I just get tired, and I, I just fall asleep. <laughs> I just fall asleep, and so I'm worthless. You can't work. Yeah, and fun, the girl, to her, it's like acid. It's like she's on meth. She's all adrenaline. Yeah. And I wake up in the morning, and she's gone, and I call her. And she had taken a bus home at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> Just all hopped up on marijuana. <laughs> See ya. I'm taking a bus. That's what you do when you're doing I blow. shut down, Let's take man. a fucking bus, bro. I shut down. <laughs> Me too. I can't, if I smoke weed, I'm, I'm a complete zombie. And I stay high for like five hours. I yeah. said to Rogan, I smoked some of his magic weed. Sure. I was like, bro, I'm, it's... It's been five hours. I got a day. I got it. I can't even drive. Yeah. I'm eating chicken at some yeah. shit. I mean, place. Chick, yeah. But yeah. what's interesting is the, especially the guys you interviewed in the sick in the head is most of them were super disciplined. I mean, there's, yes. there's a few, be. but in general, yeah. you yeah. read everyone that book, like Seinfeld is a straight killer. Yeah. Like you read how he's, he's waking up and he's writing for two hours every morning. He's sure. still writing every two when, hours when every morning. When Seinfeld, so you remember Lucian Hold? You might yes, know. Yeah. yeah, from the comic so, strip. Yeah, so, so Lucian was kind of the first guy to give me my you know spots yeah. in New York. You know, Sandler too, big big supporter of Sandler. Yes, yes, and uh, and he had something called scleroderma, so he mm-hmm. was dying, but he was a very elegant man. You know, didn't rush things. And well, Brian, uh, good stuff. Make sure you respect the light and stuff like that. And he was talking about Seinfeld. He knew Jerry really well. And when Jerry had his first appearance on Carson, it was going to be five minutes. Yeah. And apparently Jerry trained for that five minutes like a professional athlete. Like he would get up and run. He would run. <laughs> and as he was, he would jog and he would think about his set over and over again. Wow. Then he had a set time the way he would practice it. And it was literally military. So yeah. by the time he got he knew what that five minutes was going to be. He crushed it. and you know. When I did The Tonight Show, I, I finally did stand-up on The Tonight Show. Jimmy Fallon asked me to do it. But I always thought, and this was about a year and a half ago, I always thought that he asked me because he thought it would be amusing even if I bombed. Yeah. That I was a little more of a circus act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no one at The Tonight Show even asked me what my jokes were. They were just like, here's five minutes. <laughs> Here you go. Take yeah, no, your five minutes, hit your marks. Exactly. Nobody. It was so, it wasn't like a professionally uh, presented set. But anyway, I worked really hard to, to do a set. And, you know, for me as a, as a kid, especially growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, The Tonight Show was a giant thing as a comedian. That really was your dream to get on The Tonight Show. And so I was on the show, and Adam Sandler was the other guest, mm-hmm. you know, my, my, my old friend. Roommate. Uh, my, my old roommate. Yeah. And, a few days before it, Louis C.K., who I know a little bit, but not especially well, uh, but who, who's who's a great guy, he 
he wrote me an email telling me how to do the Tonight Show. Oh my God. And it was long. <laughs> it was one of the Damn. nicest things anyone's ever done. <clears throat> yeah. It was just, here's what you got to do. And it was just a list of different things you wouldn't think. Wow. Such as, <laughs> this is the one that made me laugh the most. When you walk out on stage, there will be music playing. Do not dance to it. That music is not for you. <laughs> Jesus. Excellent. Do not Excellent be, advice. Do not bop your head. But it also... It, 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 don't, don't, it's a little corny to bop your head. You're right. Hey, I'm great. I'm, I'm just hanging out, enjoying the music. Yeah. And he also said, you know, one of the scariest things ever is standing behind the curtain while the music is playing, knowing you're about to be announced... And then suddenly you're going to be shot out of a rocket That's to the do the nerves. set. He goes, it's as scary as, as anything. Yeah. What you should do in that moment as you wait for your name to be announced is just think of your first joke, only your first joke, and think about why you wrote it and think about why it made you laugh. And that will kind of set your path yeah. for your That's set. That's brilliant. And, yeah, and then what was funny is I read this and I thought – it was so nice that he, he he did that. It really blew me away. And then two hours later, a second one came in with just as long. Really? With even more. Too much, guys. man. He took <laughs> too much, bro. Too well, much. too much, man. Too much. You don't overthink it, it. It was like a magazine article. And then, <laughs> I swear to God, I took every piece of advice. I Very seriously, I read it, thought about it, did it, and it wow. all worked. Wow. Because one of the things that's fascinating is watching you um, – you know, here you are, the, pretty damn successful, but you you always have your notepad after sure. you do stand up. You're writing. I like the other day I came backstage, we were on the same venue, and Judd's writing. Yeah. Like I saw you writing jokes and shit. I was like, the guy's got his notebook out, like working shit out. You well, know? I, I don't really know another way to do it, but what makes me laugh is when I used to do stand up. So I did it from the time I was 17 till I was 24. And I was a regular at the improv, and I got on. Not Letterman and The Tonight Show, but basically everything else. Mm-hmm. The young HBO Young Comedian Special and Evening and the Improv and all those shows. Dennis Miller Show was the show I got on to do stand-up a lot yeah. when he had his talk show. Um, but I don't think I wrote anything down back then. Yeah. I had little notes, little bullet point set lists. it all here? Yeah. I don't know what I was doing. I remember Larry Miller, who was one of the best comics of all yeah, time, yeah. saying, Judd, it's like a job, and if you sit down at a desk and you write for a few hours a day like it's a job, you'll instantly be better than everybody. Yeah. Cause he said, because nobody does it. Everyone just goes to the mall. It's hard to do. Nobody sits and treats it like a job. Yeah. Yeah. And But I didn't. <clears throat> like, I go through all my old notes, and yeah. there's nothing. And now I have thousands of pages of jokes and the, notes. The Tonight Show, why it's because it's not as big as it used to be, right? Because there's so much content uh, out there. Yeah, because like you're like, not like it's not. It used to like be, back in the day, like Carson or if you're on Leno, especially even Letterman. Le- like Letterman I, at the time was. Huge. I did Letterman in '99, yeah. and I, I I've never been, and it was part of this new. Com- it was me, me, Dane Cook. It was part of this new s- comedian thing, and I've never been. I never. I don't really never suffered really from nerves doing stand up, yeah. but I've never been more nervous. Yeah. Because it was the fucking stage that... Uh, it's Letterman. Uh, well, it was where the Beatles played. Exactly. And yeah. where Elvis played. For sure don't think about the Beatles well, when you go out there. I couldn't help it. Hey, man. I couldn't help it. I was like... comic. I know. The Beatles. I know. And then I see Letterman <laughs> sitting there. I'm behind the curtain. And he's. I saw his mug. His coffee mug made me panic. I don't know why. Because it was Letterman. And also, he didn't want to... The meet. Beatles. Yo, this is... By the way, this is, this is the worst. Ready? So check this out. So I, 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 I fucking... This is the worst. I wake up that morning and i've been nervous all week and again i don't get nervous yeah. i wear the morning and i go mm, my lip i got a little oh is that a blister on my oh i have a herpes sore in the middle of my lip <laughs> herpes said oh coming on out oh he was like hey, hey let's go guys and i was like oh i have herpes oh, on a, national tv stress herpes is oh i had a stress herpes that's great as the makeup woman's trying to cover my stress herpes in the mirror oh my she goes God. it's hard for me to cover i go oh, okay I'll go out there with a shrimp on my fucking, with a baby, <laughs> one of those little shrimp. I was like, this is awesome. I can't wait. And so I go out there and I had to wear a suit. I remember I was told, if you don't wear a suit, you'll meet resistance. <laughs> uh, David Letterman thinks you should wear a suit. You know, he likes his comedians to be, you know. Yes. <laughs> Meanwhile, I watch he- Mitch Hedberg. is like, go fuck yourself. But he was Mitch Hedberg, right? <laughs> yeah. But I-, I just never forgot as I was doing my song and dance, nervous, I, I kind of calmed down. It was fine after that because I the audience, the audience, that it's audience, a great, it's a great. They audience. laugh. I mean, they're like, and you got <laughs> Paul Shea. I love playing. how you thought about the Beatles. I thought about the Beatles. Some of that I stuff go, would throw up. Like when we we did uh, 
Cobbs in San Francisco, and right before I went on, the guy, because we always start the show, I do 10, 15 minutes of comedy, the stand-up yeah. starts the show. Before I go out, the guy goes, brother, right before I go out, you know, I'm nervous, man. I'm not yeah. like seasoned vet. Like you guys, right before I go, he grabs me and goes, brother, Robin Williams here all the time. Great. Oh, I went, <laughs> thanks. Oh, oh Ro- yeah, cool, man. Yeah, I went, thanks. Like, yeah. As I turned in the middle of my set, I, I, I swear to God, yeah. Letterman was... Doing something in his desk. He wasn't paying attention. He was, no, he was like sh- rummaging around in the. I swear to God, Does that the mean it didn't door. go well. I get. Wait, did I he invite know. you over to the table? Paul, no. Paul Schrader said to me, "Is that Schaefer. his name?" Schaefer said to me, he, "Paul Schrader is so the writer nice. of Taxi Driver." Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> and, and the comfort of strangers, <laughs> yes, sir. He is well. He is well. They both. But he came up to me and he goes, "At the end of it, he goes, you killed." And I was like, "All right, as long as you yeah. I don't know." If, I There's mean, certain signs where if you get an invite, right? That's yeah. like how you know you're doing well. well uh, this is man. this is back in the day. That though, was right? a, that was more of a Johnny Carson? Carson thing. Will he let you sit yes. next to him? Yeah. And, and I hate everything I do anyway, so yeah. I can't. So I I was way ahead of anybody. If if it was if it was bad, I'm I'm way ahead. Of I him. did Letterman once, and he, uh, just as a guest, <laughs> and he was so nice to me when I came out that it completely ruined me. Really? I had just assumed it would take a little work to melt him. And then he was so warm instantly. And I hadn't prepared myself mentally oh. to be like in that vibe yeah. with him. Yeah. I thought I'd have to really work yeah. him a little was bit. Was this after you'd become... It was, like... I think, four knocked up. And I always yeah. remember that he was uh, showing the clip. And it was a clip of Jason Siegel. Maybe it was... It might, I forgot what the scene was, but I think it was Jason Siegel hitting on my wife, Leslie Mann, in the bar. But in the middle of the clip, he just turned to me and he goes, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. You know, I just uh, found him funny. You know, it was just hilarious. that guy. <laughs> <laughs> to what um, to what degree is, is uh, this is 40, like so much like your life? Did you that, write that, it? That was, did you write it line. about the Callens? That, that's my life. Like I watch, I'm like yeah. Brian. You gotta see this movie, bro. He, I think he was snooping in on it you. Was fucking, it was fucking crazy. I was well, like, it's funny. My wife and I debate <clears throat> this all the time because the second you put Paul Rudd into it, ninety yeah. percent is different. Just yeah. in the way you talk, in the way you fight, and yeah. in what you know the behavior in the house is. So you know, it certainly was partially stuff that you know we've been through. And a, and a lot, and probably even more stuff we had observed from all of our friends yeah. in that age group. And you know, some people gave us a hard time about it. But what I thought was interesting was just the idea of you know having a life, having financial problems, and trying desperately to not admit they're happening yeah. as yeah. your world crumbles. And, yeah. Yeah. and also about how a man doesn't want to admit he's having trouble and he's lying. Yeah. And, and then all the stress that creates and all the distance it creates and... Uh, I'm really happy that that movie seems to be holding up really well. I, it's more than Great. most of the movies Great. people talk about it. But so. also, re- like, I can't think of a movie, and you know, it's not a huge issue, especially in society right now, but it's a, a wealthy Brentwood family, you yeah. know, and everyone thinks everything's all good. Oh, fuck yeah. that. I don't know, it's not all no, good. And some people good. be annoyed by that. They're like, why are they complaining? They have a nice car. No, I'm like, it's a problems, lease, man. man. It's a, yeah. It is a lease. Everyone has problems. Oh, you know, you, I mean, come on. How many people do we know? That are you would think are the house their names. I mean, yeah. that are having major financial problems. There yes. are plenty well, yeah. of people that don't have fucking money. What about man? putting your kids in the movies? It's funny because my kids are older now. My daughters are nineteen and fourteen, and lately, I think part of it is I don't want to meet other people's kids. Like I don't want to sit on a set with someone else's yeah. kids and their parents. But I also always found my kids to be hilarious. They just always made me laugh. Their relationship with each other yeah. makes me laugh. Just, you know, what they fight us about makes me laugh. And in a way, I think it's a result of being a hoarder because I thought if they're in the movie, I'm going to have so much footage of them and I'll yeah. be able to own That's this cool. moment in yeah. time. And now that it has been 10 years since Knocked Up, uh, I'm so glad it exists because yeah. they're not like that anymore. Right. And it was surprising to me because I follow you on Instagram and obviously, you know, knocked up and 40 year old virgins on TV all the time. So you see your kids in that light, exactly. you know? Another it's the same one. thing when like Steve O came in here. I see Steve O from MTV's Jackass. Yeah. Yeah. When he comes in, you're like, damn. Yep. Like it's yeah. just, so when you posted a picture, I think it was some premiere or something with your kids, yeah. I'm like, damn, they grew, they grew up. the fuck up. Yeah. yeah. It's, had, had you can't you... stop it. You try to stop no, it. Yeah, do, man. But you can't. My son is five, and I, keep, I swear to God, I want to stun his growth. I, I, I'm just like, he's so damn cute. When my, my kid was always trying to walk early, 
And Ma and my oldest walked really early, like 10 months. And so when Iris tried to walk early, we didn't want her to. So I would knock her down every time. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you clip those wings. Would you want them to be uh, actors? Well, they do act. And I'm happy for anyone to be able to avoid hard work in yeah. life. Yeah. Uh, not that oh, acting not easy, isn't yeah. easy. I mean, not that it isn't hard. It is very hard. It is emotionally very hard. And it's a scary profession because you never know if you're ever going to work again. But uh, there's still... Um, so much fun to it if you could get the work and express yourself. So my daughter Iris is on our show Love. We have the show Love on Netflix, and she plays a spoiled child star on a bad show about witches. Uh, and the lead guy is the set teacher to her, and she's hysterical. And then my other daughter, who's 19, Maud, was in this great movie called Other People with Molly Shannon last oh, year. Yeah. She's and great. she's Molly in college. Shannon, by the and, way, doesn't work enough. I love her. Oh, she's brilliant in the oh. in, in the movie. She won the Independent Spirit Award for Best Actress. And, and so they're both uh, getting into it. But I always tell them, you got to write because you don't want to sit around – Mm-mm. Hoping someone thinks you're a good actress, you want to just be able to make your It'll own projects. Yes. Right? You want to be like Lena Dunham. You want someone to be someone who can just sit down and say, "Here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to write it, and then yep. I'm going to go do it." Yeah. Have you have you done a movie that wasn't really successful? I've done movies that didn't make a lot of money. Uh, I don't really have a movie where I think, "Oh God, that's so bad." Right. I feel like the worst of them would still be the best movie you'd ever watch on a plane. I think, they're, yeah, they're all. But we'll, you know I always wonder with a guy like you, like you at now, you're not even fifty yet, mm-hmm. and you've done is, you know, you've been as successful as it gets, right? Let's be honest. Mm-hmm. So now, what are what's? Do you ever find yourself kind of being like, I don't know what else to do? Or? Well, that's partially why I like doing stand up, yeah. because you know, if you say, okay, the bar is, can I be as good in a special as yeah. Maria Bamford or Hannibal or Louis or Mulaney? The bar is so high yeah. that it's it's so fun Untainable. to try to see yeah. if you can get yes. there. And th- to me, that's always what I've been interested in, movies and television. Just, you know, can I do my best work? Can I get the most out of me? You're so, something original, right? So that's why it's so fun to go to the Wilbur in Boston. I'll be at the Wilbur on the 24th <laughs> of July. I'll be at the, it's, it's so you know, on Rhode Island, uh, in <laughs> Providence, and uh, Wait, that's also right. uh, Bridgefield, Connecticut. Uh, you, you've been around comedy forever since you were a kid, and uh, people will say, especially our boy Rogan will say, this is the golden age of comedy right now. Like, yeah. It's better than it's ever been. you agree with that? I think so. Uh, you, so really? I, I mean... I wasn't expecting that out of you. I mean, you could look at it like... No one is as good as Richard Pryor, so it's not. No one's as good as Steve Martin, so it's not. But I think that we always look through it, look at it through the prism of that time and when you're Me young, too. what had an impression on you. Yeah. But if you're a young kid and you don't know anything about comedy and you see Oh Hello with Kroll and Mulaney on Netflix, that's your Steve Martin. Yeah. Uh, or Maria Bamford, what she's yes. doing. Uh, she's incredible. I, I mean, yeah, she makes me laugh. I mean, there, she's I watch my a, favorite. She, in many yeah. ways, like for me, having been in this business as long, Maria Banford is so good at shocking. Like yes. I, for me, mm. I think she's. If you want to talk about original, I think she might be the most original comic male female Ever. period. Yeah, I, Ever. for me, and yeah. gets better and better. And I, you know, I on an episode of her show playing myself, oh, wow. episode six for those out there of uh, Lady Dynamite. And I don't really act, but she said, could you do this part where you offer me a job in a movie and I'm so afraid of success, I say no. And she comes to my office and we improvise and it's so fun. And then the second season, she put me in an episode uh, and I said, okay, third season, I want an arc. I want, I want, I need you to make (laughs) a movie. The Avatar arc. (laughs) It's the only acting I could do is a, a version of myself who's just an asshole. My, my asshole you play it, but you're not I, be a I was telling challenge. B this when especially when I was uh writing a lot I uh I found like I, I don't relate to a lot of comics like mm-hmm. like I read the Steve Martin bur- book it kind of broke my heart kind of went down a dark road sure. I read a bunch of other uh you know comedy kind of biography stuff like that and but yours was one of the especially when it's you and Adam Sandler when you first moved to LA and it just hear me out it kind of broke my heart because you talk about how you realize when you saw Jim Carrey and you saw Adam Sandler just doing prank calls that you know you couldn't compete with those guys kind of stage. So that's when you started writing. Yeah, that, because... to me, to me that made me sad because I'm like, what? Here's a brilliant mind, and comedy is really not how you look or anything like that. And you're comparing yourself to Adam Sandler and Jim Carrey, who you're talking about two freaks. 
That's like any basketball player, but like, God, I'm not like LeBron, so I'm not going to try this out. Well, it's a weird piece of bad luck to be starting as a comedian at a very young it age. It almost screwed you. It, 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 well, it's funny because I think Adam gets annoyed when I say this because he was my biggest fan as a comedian. He was always just such a massive supporter. Yeah. And when I did Carnegie Hall last year, I did my set, and then afterwards, Adam came out and did a surprise half oh, hour wow. after me, and then we sang a song together. It was magical. That's it really was great. the best. But it is like trying to be a songwriter and your roommate's John Lennon. That's what it felt like. And and then you think, what am I doing? I don't think my songs yeah. are as good as his songs, especially uh, because what Adam was doing was so strange and so uh, wonderful Original. when he was young. It was really weird. What was he doing? Act. Like singing and stuff? Well, he, it was before. He wasn't even doing the guitar. He was doing... You know, Elvis lives in my refrigerator. Very, <laughs> very like surreal comedy. Yeah. Um, and then Jim Carrey had just quit doing impressions, and he would go on stage and improvise the whole act. And it, half the time he would kill, half the time he would bomb, but like really bomb. Yeah, like like people leaving bombs. Major bomb. risks. Yeah, and within the same set, he'd oh, lose yeah. him, get him back, lose him. And it was so creative. And I I felt it at the time watching Jim. Oh. This is the biggest star in the world, and no one here knows it yet. Yeah. You could just you could feel it yeah. bubbling up, and it was very intimidating to me because, as a fan, I knew, oh, I'm not like these guys. Now, as of someone who's 49 years old, I have a lot of stories and I have a point of view, and it's and it's different. Right. But as a kid, I felt like that screwed. Like I was reading, and I'm like that kind of screwed. I can relate to that in in the sports world because my best friend was this guy Joe Kloffenstein, and he was. A one percent of the premier premier athlete. He was shredded, six six, yeah. two hundred seventy pounds, fast for me. Everything. I'm like, well, if that's that's a professional. I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. Yeah. So he gave me this chip on my shoulder. Where I'm like, I should have to work harder because I'm not like him. But when I was reading your your book, I I was like, God, he got screwed. Kind of being best friends with Adam Sandler, having him as a roommate, and that's the level that you or, see. Or he got lucky because what he did is went on to write amazing movies and become yeah. like this well, i don't know. i'm not upset about the fact that i didn't do stand-up all those years uh i got burnt out on it too i loved yeah. it so much i watched I, I i watched so many comedians and i knew everyone's act inside and out i was i just was such a fan that i got a little burnt out on it so i never think to myself oh man it would have been great to be a comedian in my 30s or or whatever because it's so fun now and it's fun to do it where I don't need set. to pay my rent. You know, like, there's a pressure when you first start out to eat. Yeah. And so if I would go <laughs> to get a gig in Rancho Cucamonga for 75 bucks, it, I needed that 75 bucks. Yeah, it's different. You know, I had my rent was $425 a month, and I worked for it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was hard to get when I was young and not and There are plenty good. of road comics still at, at 50 and, and 55 that, yeah. it, it you know, they had... They had their moment, but now they're back to trying to fill small rooms and not yes. making a lot of money. And they're great, and they've been doing it for as long as anybody like Louis C.K. or anything else. So stand-up is a tough, tough yes. road when you're still flying coach and still trying to rent that car on a deal and still staying yeah. at the Best Western in a, in a blizzard. And a lot of ageism. Oh, you can just dude. feel it. I've talked yeah. to guys, like legendary guys, who, who 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 told me about that. Like it's hard to get booked in these clubs now yes. because Even, they're because they're older. Just because, or they're just not on a show. They're they not don't on have social a showcase. media. They're not on a well, show. I was talking to. Uh, I just got back from Australia. I was doing uh, comedy out there, and I was talking to the promoter, and he was saying to to the, that ageism stuff. He goes, "I don't book older guys anymore, o older acts, or if it's o older music musicians because." They they don't have a following on social media, yeah. and if they don't, then I have to pay to market them and sell tickets. He goes, I can just book a young kid who's really good on social media, has a subscription, you know, on YouTube, and it's gonna. I don't have to do anything. He sells it himself. Yeah. Goes, I, so why waste the dollars on it? I used to not be on anything, and then I showed up at a bookstore to promote my first book, which is called uh, "I Found This Funny," which is like a collection of like just short <laughs> stories and sketches and things that I thought were funny. Just, right. just things I collected. And I show up at a bookstore with my daughter. There's 12 people there. God. 
in this enormous bookstore. Twelve people there, and, and I, yes. I said, I gotta, I gotta find a way to connect with people because whenever you do things, sometimes no one shows up. I did a Q and A with Cameron Crowe. I thought it would be packed for one of my movies. Yeah. There was no one there, <laughs> and no I, one. And I thought, and Cameron Crowe's a legend. Does it make you feel like nothing makes you feel like more like a loser than yeah. when you got to do a signing and no one shows yeah. up? No and, it's pr- and you just go, oh, it's just bad promotion. I can't assume. I never assume anyone's going to show up to anything. I always yeah. get on yeah, social media. Either. Yep. If they go do a Q and A at the movie theater after your movie. I, I hit it because I always show up. And it's my biggest no fear. One there. It's yeah. my biggest fear I, every time. The worst one was, I think it was for This Is 40. Uh, and they, maybe this is the worst one. We had the screening at like the Motion Picture Academy. And it was a big theater. Yeah. It's like a 600 seat theater. Yeah. And there was like 40 people there. And we have to do a Q&A with the full oh, cast. Oh, my and, God. It's so oh bad. And then God. I just started going on Twitter. and uh, Yeah, because you're competing with, you know, everything. And yes. if you don't have people that are actually, you know, because everybody finds an excuse to do anything else, and yeah. getting them to get in their car, pay a babysitter, yeah. and all that stuff, and drive to see you. But also, never, how never. like it's it's never been easier to sell tickets though. You look at it that yeah. way. It's never been easier. Yeah. You are your own publicist. It's in your hand. If you cannot put together 144 characters on why people should see you, you shouldn't fucking be doing stand up. Yeah, <laughs> 144 it, it, characters. Just, yeah, tweet. It, it, it's it's a it's what's interesting though is that if you didn't grow up with that at all in your brain, the idea yeah. that you can do that is something I've had to wrestle with. You know, I'm a realist, and I mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm on none of us did be it. I mean, this is uh, eight years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, eight it's, years. It's just you know? some people have a yeah. I don't know, man. It's also you're also asking people of my generation at least, to self-promote, which I've been told my whole life, yes. my whole life has been, that's impolite, yes. it's <laughs> shitty, yeah. it's gross, it's, it's, not what, it's not what a man should do. I mean, all that stuff that you're kind of like, come see me, huh? Yeah. No, let those other people do that shit. I oh, just want to yeah. do with the work. I get so nervous, too, selling tickets, because it's, it's, you know, with a movie, it's, it's terrifying. Because yeah. you, I you, can't imagine. <clears throat> you work on it for years, and then... Sometimes they can tell you the day before it opens what it will make. Oh, how it's tracking, Like, like right? they can figure it out just from pre-sales. Yes. Like, they can extrapolate and know. And, and this so, is your baby. In four and it's years. The, the big sick. It opens Friday. You just go, it's years of work. I know it's great. Are people going to show up? I, I won't know, you know, until the day before that, this makes that me day. Nervous. And But with tickets, it's, I, I always laugh with Pete Holmes because sometimes we go and do concerts together. And I always go like, Pete, you're just such a terrible draw. You're so <laughs> terrible. And we'll be on social media and like, well, I think we're in a bad market. Is it, is it us? Like, is it me? Like, what is it? And then it'll always like sell out like two days before. I'm like, why is it always like the <laughs> yeah. second before we get yeah. there? It sells out. Because that's how people, I think, on social media are as well. Yeah. Like, ah, they, they procrastinate and then I'll get it last. Yeah. It depends. Know, last like we it added depends. a second show at uh, the Wilbur. And I'm, you know, I'm doing these shows just to practice. So I, I, I don't really... They're not really uh, gigs for any reason other than I need to run the Netflix special and I want to do a good job and have fun. And so we added a second show for charity, for like the Boston like arts, for after school arts right. for kids so that they can, uh, you know, because that's the first thing they always cut is you know, the bands or plays or, or yeah. something. And so then they put the new show <clears throat> on sale and I'm like, okay, we, we got a month. We got a month and I'm instantly terrified the whole month, more than a movie, even. <laughs> really? No. <laughs> That's why I'm glad I'm not on the road. Because it's all so the time. personal. Because it's you. Exactly. Like they're coming to see you. And, and oh you're yeah, alone. it's not like like a movie. Uh, like you got a it's not really like team, a, you got a no. Whole, this is we do not like you. Right. In Phoenix, Arizona, we do not like right. Brendan. Yeah. You've sold seven <laughs> tickets. Oh my god. Oh no, we canceled only one show. Me and Pete, we canceled one show, and it was Irvine, and everyone was like. Or maybe it was Anaheim. Yeah. And everyone was like, oh, no, because it's just, there, there's Disneyland there and whatever. Like, that's the worst market yeah. for stand up. Although, yeah. I still might, tell you might that. have been us. They'll tell you that. I and mean, there's always an excuse that to make you feel better, right? Exactly. Now, well, the, well, NBA, the, well, the, the games are. Well, right. no. The, like, yeah. the Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather fights on uh, August 26th. I had to cancel DC. I was on, I was on, you were on speakerphone <laughs> when we were in our agent's <laughs> office, and you're like, I'm going to do DC. And I looked at Justin, like, that's the night of Floyd Mayweather McGregor. It, tell Brian, oh, he's, there's the gonna be yeah, there's I'm gonna be glad. one person there to see him. Oh, I'm glad. Now, you what's said gonna that. happen at that fight? Because I wouldn't have thought about. What's it. your prediction of how that goes down? Oh, uh, man. And what are the rules? The rule it's it's standard boxing rules: ten ounce gloves, twelve mm-hmm. rounds. Yeah. Um, you know, 
Standard boxing. Yeah. Standard boxing. So it's it's going to, you know, uh, for Connor, it's going to be, he, he, he has pressure on him just because he represents the mixed martial arts world. Yeah. And then obviously Floyd Mayweather, one of the best of all time. And I, I, I argue this all the time with, with people. It, it's going to take a, there's going to be a feeling out period where, cause Floyd's never seen Connor style. Connor's never seen Floyd style. So there's going to be this weird, awkward, awkwardness yeah. for like the first few rounds, which I think Connor can win some of those rounds. Then once Floyd kind of figures out his timing, distance, the awkwardness, what Connor's game plan is, he'll start to take over. Yeah. And he'll, Floyd will win in a yeah. in a decision, but it's going to be a little bit of feeling out period. Is there? Any... So it's going to be the biggest fight of our lifetime. And and will it be a good fight? It's going to be entertaining. Yeah, it's going to be a better fight than people think. That's exciting. I mean, I remember when I was a kid. You know, it was like you know Ali Holmes. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It, it, I, I remember the the uh, you know they would have those things on like what was it like what was it called like that closed circuit what what it would be you um, know people would watch them in bars and yeah. stuff and they they were like pay per view yeah it was yeah. closed circuit TV closed circuit TV yeah. and I because I remember very clearly as a kid the Leon Spinks fight yes sure uh, and um, I when and he those beat things, Ali remember. Yeah, and it was like what? <laughs> I mean, as a kid, you remember? I remember I didn't see it, but I remember hearing Leon Spinks beat Muhammad Ali. What? There's that great documentary about Holmes beating Ali. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, you know, Holmes was his sparring partner. Yeah, for years. Amazing documentary. And again, that'll break your heart. That documentary sure. break your heart. Yeah, yeah, if you watch it, because Ali he shouldn't been fighting, suffered brain trauma. It's well, terrible. when you watch, um, what is that? When we were kings, which is an amazing documentary. And you watch Ali sparring with this dude with these long arms, and he's just pop, 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 pop. And you're like, you can't help but say, whoever that sparring partner is is really good. And then the headgear comes out. And you're like, well, that's Larry Holmes. <laughs> that's, oh, that's nothing oh, new. Like, yeah. Anthony Joshua was training yeah. partners of Klitschko. Like, this oh, okay. is how it goes. Yeah. But this quietly, goes. wasn't Larry on. Holmes one of the best of all time? Yes. All but time. he was so boring as a man. Not a draw. Uh, yeah. But he killed everybody. Yes. And no one talks everybody. about him. No one talks about him. He didn't have him. the personality he of Ali. He had the craziest jab in the world. He was just, and is it possible that, that in his prime, better than Ali in his prime? 100%. Yeah, but, but, be, but they, not they, funny enough. There's a story to be told that, yeah, he's, he didn't have the personality to back Retired up. Retired wealthy. So he's got money. People yeah. only talk about Muhammad Ali when there's up, there's yeah. better fighters out there, man. But this is what people, no one ever talks about, is that when you're funny, it changes everything. Like I kept saying during the election... That I thought Trump was going to win, yeah. because he was funny. Yeah. I don't think he has a good sense of humor about other people. Yeah. He's, you know, he is like an MC. Yeah. And I thought Reagan was a funny guy. Yes. Clinton was funny. Yeah. Al Gore was not funny. Nope. I thought George Obama Bush was, was funny. funny. Obama may be the funniest of all time. Yeah. And I think really so funny. funny that he had to hide how funny he yeah. was. Because yep. I remember watching him do a, a town hall when he was running for president. He was taking questions, and he was. He was got kind of dark and edgy with someone asking a question, like too funny. Wow. And I thought, oh, you can't be that funny. You yeah. can't also be you don't look in giving that people a hard time. And and right. I mean, I I wrote jokes for the correspondence dinner, oh, wow. um, the year that he made fun of Trump, and I couldn't believe how hysterical he was. So Which his, del- Trump his delivery, campaign. his timing, yeah. his ability to wait. Like yeah. those pauses, where he the never confidence. stumbled on a word. No, I mean he never. No. He's the president. I, when, He's the president when, my my buddy, my buddy uh, John Durant was talking about. Um, he knew Trump was going to win when um, Trump. They were talking about. They said, "Well, you know, Mitt Romney's rich, very rich," and Trump goes, "He's not rich. I'm rich. <laughs> you know, he's got 180 million dollars." I'm rich. Like, like he embraced it, like because they were talking about how wealth is a liability when you yes. run for president, and you think he goes. And they, they, so the, the follow-up question was, Mitt Romney had trouble getting yes. votes because he was so wealthy. Do you think you're going to have the same? And he wouldn't even – he was so smart to like go, what? Yeah. Wealthy? He's not wealthy. Uh, he's, I'm he's wealthy. Next question. Like, like Yeah, he just he, – but he embraced it. He, but you know. some people can get away with it. You know, Jay-Z and Beyonce can yeah. say, I slay – 
and I'm rich, and I got vanilla it's wafers good. in yeah. the villa, yeah. Yeah. and it's good. And then, like, if I did that, you just be like, shut the fuck oh, up. Oh, you're right. bragging, bro. <laughs> fuck you, man. You have to have, like, testosterone behind it. Like, you got to kind of be, like, like there's got to be a fuck you to like, it. No well, shame. Like, well, if yeah. you watch Kevin Hart, like, if you follow Kevin Hart on Instagram or anything yeah. or on Twitter, yeah. I mean, it like, it's hashtag rock star comedy shit and it's like him from a private jet yeah. him in a lamborghini i'm like he's always been if that way anyone now. ever posted that yeah. like if yeah. a white guy was doing that he'd be so screwed well, you'd have no fans he's so funny because kevin was like on the phone and we were doing this movie and he's talking and he goes yeah so just put the um well you can put the tv there then i guess like yeah i don't, I don't know how you're gonna center it and he goes sorry i'm having mansion problems <laughs> anyway, he goes back there. Like he, he's always been that guy. Like I, I love, I love his uh, so Instagram. Fun. But you look at, and I was, I was thinking about this the other day. It's him and his wife in a brand new like Bentley yeah. or Royals Royce, yeah. and he's gold Rolex hanging out, and he's like rich problems. <laughs> I'm like, God, can you imagine if freaking Bill Burr did that? Or you know, it's interesting because I think you know some of it is uh, culture. Like, I had a joke about this once. It's like, you know. Like I can't brag about money. Like I can't be like, oh yeah, we 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 flew in a private jet, but it was a special time, and I wouldn't do it again because of the environment. It's a one time you know? thing. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, you don't come across as, but you are Judd Apatow. At the end of the day, you can fly privately. So, well, I, I know what you mean though. It's, I, I'm it'd be a little awkward for you. I think if you started from nothing, you have that. I made it. You can make it two things. Yes. yes. But Trump didn't start from nothing. He started with so he forty resented. million. Yeah, but Trump. But Trump's got that sort of rough. New York construction worker thing. Like yeah. they always said he could talk to construction workers because sure. Trump is not what you'd consider like he's not like an erudite intellectual. Yeah. Trump is a his hands are dirty. Like you can mm-hmm. feel it. He's a big kind of brash guy. Out of shape, dude. Yeah. He's just like, oh fuck yourself. I play golf more than everybody else. He's he a doesn't good golfer, believe in exercise way. though. He said that yeah. exercise makes you tired. Oh yeah. yeah. He has a theory which I love that he's created his own nutritional yeah. science. Yeah, it's he's he's he says that you only have so much energy a day and he doesn't want to waste it on exercise. No, because he says your body's a battery. You have a lifetime pure. battery. And if you, and so. The ultimate bro science. Yeah, the right. ultimate bro science. No, he has two Our things. Our president has the ultimate yep. bro science. Two things he talks about. One is he says he's got good stuff. So his, the blood, his blood, which is Germanic. He goes, my, it's kind of pretty, he's basically a Nazi. He's like, <laughs> I got good stuff. My genetics are very strong. And then he looks at his body as a battery. So, so. You, like you only have friend, so many beats. Yes, I always say this. Yeah, you only have so many yeah, beats. So his friends are trying to He took that to heart. Yes. I don't know if he's flying kids. Yes. And he took that to heart and was like, you're right. I only have so many beats. I'm yeah. not working out. His friend's a triathlete, and he's like, you're going to die early. His, he's he might be, so he out of shape. Right. He's, he's so he's out of so shape. shape and, get, and getting worse and just sitting there eating all day long. Because I, I was always surprised that people like uh, you know George Bush and Obama have the time to put in a real workout yeah. every day. Obama had a basketball court put in the White House. Half yeah. court. I I, I, I mean, it. I certainly, I hate to say I relate to Trump because I'm probably closer to Trump than Obama <laughs> where I create my own Have you own met him? Science. Have you met Trump? I, I'll tell you what I met Trump. I, the improv, they opened an improv in Atlantic City. Mm. And at the time, Trump was at war with Merv Griffin. Yep. They had some I remember sort of it very well. Merv Griffin Why? fight. No, so, what, so Merv told me this story. Oh, great. So I shot something with Merv. And Merv, um, so, so Merv said, they were talking about whether he's as wealthy as Donald Trump. So Merv said, well, I'm a lot more wealthy than Donald Trump because when they talk about Donald Trump's wealth, what they always forget to say is, uh, they always forget to mention one word, debt. So Donald writes, <laughs> yeah, Merv Griffin <laughs> yeah. had money yeah. Yeah. and no debt, yeah. okay? And so Merv- I love the guy like that that's tough. Like, it's Merv, but he'll- He'll kill it's you. It's Merv, <laughs> the great Merv. Oh, by the way, wrote the theme song to Jeopardy. Yeah. Well, we were shooting Fat Actress with yeah. Kirstie Alley, and he was he was a guest star, and he would he would do things like he'd just start playing the piano, and I had I had this this watch my dad gave me. It was kind of a cool watch, and I and he goes, "That's a nice watch." And me joking around, I go, "Yeah, yeah it's from Switzerland. Don't touch it, though." Yeah. And he goes, "Oh, don't is it expensive?" I go, "Yeah, it's expensive, Merv." Because he is, and he goes, "Oh." I have this watch. It's a it's a vintage Rolex. Those are diamonds that are tumbling around it. <laughs> you can touch it if you want. <laughs> only ten minutes. He said he was a great. But so with Donald Trump, so he had a great sense of humor. And so Donald Trump said to him, um, he wrote him a letter, a really nasty letter, essentially saying, "Hey, you can't do this, you know, because I'm wealthy and part of my brand 
requires that people know that I'm wealthy and you can't you can't make me look bad in the media and basically this this whole nasty thing. And so Merv wrote him back something kind of quippy, like um, joking around, yeah, yeah, joking around, saying, "Oh, take it easy, whatever, you know, don't be a baby." And then I think he did another interview where Merv re- reiterated <laughs> that you know he's got debt. And now, so, so now check this out. So then, so then Donald writes him back a, a really nasty letter, like with all kinds of yes. nasty um, sort of profanity. So. So Merv Griffin, president, Merv Griffin. Oh, I'm sorry. Merv Griffin said this in the interview. He said, look, if he keeps up because because he started bad mouthing Merv on the interviews. So Merv said, look, if he keeps bad mouthing me, I'm going to have to buy his buildings, which won't be difficult because he doesn't really own them. And I'm going to have to take the T off the name. So it says rump. So it says rump. <laughs> and I can do that. So Donald Donald writes back this really nasty letter now. Now it's a really nasty letter after he, he Now this is old school if they're writing letters. Yes, they're writing letters. So this, this is back in private? The, this is all private. Yeah. This is Merv told me this. So yeah. so he he writes so he says, You better be careful. But Merv, I guess in the interview said, You better be careful, I'll take the tea off your name. I'll buy your bill and take the tea off your name. So Donald writes him this insanely letter with all full of profanity. Merv Griffin took the letter and put a little note on the top of the letter and sent it back to Donald Trump. And it said this, Donald, I think somebody's stealing your stationery and writing <laughs> me terrible letters so that they want me to dislike you and create a big problem between us. He said, you better find out who's stealing your stationery because this profanity is totally uncalled for. And I know you would never use this kind of stuff. Do you know what Donald wrote back? He wrote back, Sorry. you're a class act. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, Donald capitulated. But that's, that's also like a, that's also like a, a like a little boy who can't control his emotions and then feels shame after. That's right. Yeah, I realized but he was that also dealing up. with a big dog. I think right. Donald, to his credit, probably realized. Oh, I'm dealing with. Mer- so, what Griffin. was your experience with him? Well, I think they had some clash in Atlantic City because they both owned hotels, and I, I don't remember what the details were, but they had a, an actual issue Property having issue. to do with real estate in in Atlantic City. And I guess they worked it out somehow. It might have been the result. That of, might have been what, that might have been what started it. But yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, and so they opened an improv at um, Harrah's, I think it was. And the opening night was me and Charles Fleischer. Oh and God, then, I love and then, Charles Fleischer. And then it was a big deal. That Do you know Tra- of Charles Fleischer? Mm-hmm. Oh. oh yeah, he was the voice of Roger Abbott. He was on Welcome Back, Goddard. Oh, so he was in Zodiac. He was the guy that you kind of think was probably yeah. the killer at the end. Oh, I love Zodiac. Yeah, he's the best. And. Uh, he uh, came to the show uh, with Merv. So Trump and Merv oh, were in the crowd. That's great. And uh, I wish there was a picture. Oh, man, because no, I was like 1991, 1990. It would have been hysterical if there was a picture of me, Merv, and Trump. Uh, Hell yeah. Merv was was uh, my friend. I never, but my friend who is also gay, Merv Griffin was gay. And w- I, my friend went to his house to have, you know, um, a lunch or something. And Merv had this sprawling estate with all these young hot men yes. who were like his staff, you know, yeah. which was great. You said young hot men as his staff working for him nonstop? Yeah, young hot <laughs> men, just the hot as shit dudes, like around the pool, like in shorts, like serving drinks. I mean, that's what my buddy said, and he doesn't, he's not prone had, to making things I had up. lunch with him pretty, not that long before he died, just a, for never met him. Such a I, 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 remember, I remember going to see tapings of the Merv Griffin show when I was a kid. When I was like 12, I came and visited yeah. California and we went to see the Merv Griffin show and the guests were Jay Leno and Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Oh my God. And I remember the Dr. Ruth. Remember Dr. Ruth, Brennan? So Se- she was a she was a sex you bring her up. She was a sex therapist. Oh, I do so remember. She her. was a little the she older was, lady, yes. and she would answer. Well, yeah, say goodbye, say bye bye. She was always full of this, uh, you know. And she she took calls on the Merv Griffin show. Right. Then the next guest is Leno, and Leno's like, "So I don't understand. You're taking calls, <laughs> but this show." It's not live. <laughs> Who's calling? <laughs> Who's calling Merv for sex advice? <laughs> and he, then as I pulled, and as I walked out of the parking lot, I remember the other guest was Lucy Arnaz, Lucille Ball's daughter, and she almost hit me with her car. But like really almost. Wow. Killed me. <laughs> wow. Yes, I do remember her. Yes. I yeah. do remember her. She spoke at USC when I was there, and I was one of the, the, the heads of the speakers you know, committee, and I was in a limousine alone with her, and I, we picked her up from the airport. And then she changed her dress in the car 
with me in the back with her. And then she's, she's like, you're going to tell your friends about this one day. <laughs> yep. I <laughs> sure am. Man. <laughs> yeah, man. Merv Griffin, I remember just spending the week with him and I had fantasies of being his friend. Like, I just liked him that so much. he's so nice. Oh, but he's really? so funny. He was the he just best. just cracked me up. He's just a fu- like, and I said to him, I said, "You're this mogul. Like, you're so like rich and pow- powerful. How do you run your business?" And he said, "I show up. Everybody's sitting at the table, and I just ask for ideas. We we just yeah. go over, and I basically keep communication open, and that's kind of how we do it." Yeah. I think I think there's a there's sometimes where again I read a book or I'll I'll hear a story. I'm like, "Dang, I wish they were my friends." I know. Or dang, I wish <laughs> I go like uh, I read the Saturday. Night, so I grew up on Saturday Night Live. Like that was my Bible, man. I loved it. Mm-hmm. And so I read the uh, twenty or fifty year anniversary book. It was just a history of Saturday Night Live. And uh, they talked about how back in the day it was like, you know, Jim Belushi and all the guys, they would get done and they go to this one bar afterwards. And, you know, the act, it, may, it was maybe Aerosmith or Guns N' Roses, they would play just for the small crowd. But they'd all go there yeah. and there'd be drugs and liquor. I was like, dang, I wish I was part of <laughs> Dang, I wish I was part of that. Yes. <laughs> Give yourself a blow problem. Exactly. Just fucking burn it at both ends. It was just everyone was so creative, yeah. you know. And it's I all, don't know it's like, how they wrote that show on, on drugs. <laughs> Although if you watch them old SNLs from the 70s, you can you tell. You can get it. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell their sketches had made no sense. No sense. No sense. Have you, yeah. have you done Saturday Night Live? I always wanted to write for Saturday Night Live. When I lived in Sandler, he left and got a job. At Saturday Night Live, and so did Rob Schneider and David Spade. Yeah, and that's all I ever wanted to do was to write for Saturday Night Live, and I could never get on a job there. And I also was writing sketches for Jim Carrey for In Living Color. He would just pay me out of his own pocket so that when wow. he was at work, he'd have extra sketches. Wow! And I kept trying to get a job there. I couldn't get those gigs. I'm yeah. curious about that because you you've written for a lot of people. I think people would be if you haven't read the book, they'd be super surprised that the. the comedians that you've written for mm. you know like Roseanne Barr yeah, and that was like Tom my, Arnold one and, of my first big jobs was writing jokes I thought her story Roseanne. was the best I thought her story like her in I, it's not I don't think a lot of people know it, but you read her story and just what she was going through and married it's in Denver and she was like you know she's at uh the comedy works and she's making it and she's dealing with all this stuff and then she has uh you know she's kind of sick in the head a little bit to you know not to quote your book but yeah. you know she she has she has some depression issues and bipolar and mm. it was fascinating and then suddenly you give her a show and this is the thing that no one ever realizes some suddenly you're in charge of a crew of 100 people so if you're the type of person that's not great with people or yourself or yourself yeah. and now you're in charge of a writing staff and directors and it's very challenging, especially for comedians who are just suddenly thrown into this position. I always felt like I had seen that so many times that when Lena Dunham started Girls, I knew how to advise her because I saw Shanlin go through it and Roseanne and so many people. Just management. Just yeah. how do I keep these people happy? How do I hire the right people? How do I set the right vibe? Because if if you're in a bad mood, you, your whole set. If you're the captain of the ship, the whole ship's chaos. Yeah. And your for, your first your education mm-hmm. in writing came from Gary Shanley, right? Yeah, and and all of it more than I even realized at the time because the first job I had of any uh, note was Gary asked me to write jokes for the Grammys, and that was a huge deal. So this was '91, I think, and. It was the year Eric Clapton won everything for Tears in Heaven, I think. Mm. It was two years we did it. One year, like Tina Turner won a ton, and um, Sinatra was on it, and Bono, and Nicholson, and Bob Dylan performed during... It was right when the Gulf War started, and then Dylan played Masters of War punk style. Couldn't understand a word he said. And, <laughs> and just, you, you know, when you're kind of a mediocre comic and now you're in a room writing jokes with Chandler <laughs> and really all you're doing is writing setups and he's writing punchlines. Yeah. Uh, is that right? Yeah, because he's just such a great joke writer. So you go, oh, you should do something about how Kiss got back together and 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 then he would just like say oh. the joke. And you're, you're just lining him up for him. Wow. And... I, I, you know, I think you learn just by watching someone do it and watching how they think. And you don't even know what you're learning. Mm. You're just seeing his mind work. I'm doing a documentary about Gary Shandling for HBO that's going to be on oh, in nice. March. That's going to be a big epic thing. I keep saying it's like the OJ doc of Gary. Really? It's just a big, long, epic history of Gary, history of comedy through Gary's eyes. Of the last but how do you do so years. much, bro? How do you do, like, how do you have all these projects? We got Crashing, we got mm. Girls. 
We got um, love. this. We got love. We big got, sick. We got the big we sick. We got Judd at the Wilbur. We got Judd at the Wilbur. <laughs> the Wilbur. But it's true. Look, Just okay. So, so right now, special. crashing. You got the yeah. big sick. You got uh, girls. You got. I mean, you. Why am I here? Uh, what are you doing? <laughs> the fire and the kid, and then you got the Wilbur, and you got where? Where are the other dates? Uh, Either way. <laughs> Rhode Island. It's uh, shooting a Netflix special in fucking Montreal. It's crazy. How do you uh, how do you keep how do you do this shit? Well, for TV, you know, you're really hiring showrunners and you're finding collaborators that know what they're doing, and then you could figure out what you do. So, Pete Holmes has his show. Pete Holmes is an amazing writer. He's just an incredible writer. He has a vision for the whole thing. Uh, I, w- I worked hard with him to get him a great writing staff. Greg Fitzsimmons is over there. Awesome. I love Greg. Now, and uh, love Jamie Greg. Lee and a lot of great people. And uh, and Judah Miller runs that, that show with him. And so, you know, I break stories with him and I write episodes. I, I don't spend much time on set. I mainly work on the writing and the editing. And, uh, you know, so sometimes at night I just sit with the script and put in a, my time with a really clear head saying, okay, here, here's what's left yeah. to yeah. do. Um, if the set was chaos, then my life would cave in. But, you know, if you hire great directors and your scripts are great, yeah, then a lot of it is editing and writing, and uh, and that's how we do love as well. And and the Shanley documentary, you know, that's you know, it's a year long project, yeah, uh, and it's, I mean, it's it's a big piece. <laughs> that's a that's a big piece of work. But I have a brilliant. So for editor. for you, is it more about things to say no to? Because I'm sure you get how many freaking offers or well, ideas? Well, well or... now I have a light fall, and so I'm trying to see if I can keep it light. And 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 read. You know, sometimes it's good to just take like four months and go. I'm just gonna read. I'm just gonna read all the books I should have read yeah. a long time ago, and 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 take another run at waking my brain up. <laughs> but I think people don't do that yeah. a lot. You know, right before a lot of things started turning in a good direction for me, I took a year off and just read. Mm. I just said, you know, I don't think novels. I, yeah, I didn't anything read. in particular? Just just everything. I just sat down and went. You know, I've never read. The Great Gatsby. Yep. Mm. I've, I've, I've never, you know, classics, read man. any of these books that everyone says I should have read, and even now I haven't read most of them. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm going to try to do that in the fall again because I just, I don't know what it does. You're touching on a really, really important subject, though, yeah. because I think it's really important to feed yourself with th- when you read, even works that have nothing to do with you, or, or and about people that live a very different life than you do, or just the great classics. There's a reason. Yeah. That those stories are still relevant, mm-hmm. or they're "quote unquote" classics, yeah. because they are. They they have something in them that feeds you. I think that kind of like either humbles you, makes you sit back and kind of realize that you're part of something much bigger, or not part of something much bigger, which also has its own value. It also kind of maybe amplifies your own limitations. And it also tunes you into how people think. Mm-hmm. You know, when a great writer is describing the inner life of somebody, <sighs> it reminds you of how you should create your characters and how deeply you should create mm-hmm. them because when things are bad usually they're shallow and mm-hmm. if you take the time the way gary did and said okay we're gonna figure out hank kingsley who is this guy to the bone this isn't he was sh- my acting teacher by the way oh for, amazing yeah, acting he, teacher. for five years yeah uh, so so um jeffrey, jeffrey tambor. tambor oh yeah yeah with the great yeah, yeah uh and he was so amazing in that and you know jeffrey tells a story about he's got a book out Yep. A, a great book about his life. Je- uh, Jeffrey does? Yeah, just put it out. Uh, oh, wow. I, I got to get it. Because Jer- Jeffrey talked about when he really wanted that part, and his acting teacher, Milton Katsala, said, mm-hmm. call him. And he said, because it, it was between, you know, uh, Jeffrey and somebody else. Yeah. And Jeffrey called Gary. And Jeffrey was like stumbling and going, I, I just think I could really do this part. And I, I, I just think I, I, I'd be really good for it. And, you know, I, I would never, ever do this. I, I would never, ever call somebody. I've never done this before. I would never do this. And you know what Gary said? Gary goes, Hank Kingsley would. Wow. And he went and he hung up the phone. And he goes, I think I got it. And that was it. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, that's yeah. a great story. Isn't that great? Man. I was always such a fan of Jeffrey. Oh, and I remember that dude, moment because oh. Gary played me the auditions. Mm. Uh, and I said, wait a second, that's the guy who's my favorite character on NYPD Blue, who plays the judge. And he also is the judge in in Justice for Justice for All. All. Remember him throwing the plates? And he happened to be someone that was just very on my radar as my favorite character actor. Mm -hmm. And when he showed me, I was like, 
That's the best guy of all, of, <laughs> of all, time. all time, dude. And, and Justice for All. So I I took his acting class because I found out that that guy who threw plates in Injustice for All. I'm serious. Yeah. Really? He was yeah, well. And Justice for All. If anybody hasn't seen it, Al Pacino. It still holds up. It. It's one of the great movies. Am I yes. wrong? Oh, it's, it's one of the great, and it's one of the great. It's what made Al Pacino. In a lot of ways, besides yes. The Godfather, I mean, where well, that was the went, first yelling Pacino holy performance. Holy fuck! <laughs> holy fuck! It's about a lawyer, and it's it's one of the most beautiful movies ever. But Jeffrey Tambor, who comes in with that, he goes crazy. He has yeah. a he has a toupee, yeah. and uh, it, it anyway. The point is, I, I took that class, and that, that's kind of why. And, yeah. and and does uh, he does he still teach? Uh, I don't probably, think he's so. Too busy. Jeffrey was a Scientologist, and he left the church. Mm-hmm. He quote unquote blew. Yeah. And when he blew, uh, he just stopped teaching at the Beverly at the Beverly Hills Playhouse where I took, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. classes for I'm not a Scientologist, but I took classes there yeah. for 10 years. Well, everybody, Jim Carrey uh, took uh, yeah. um, Milton and Jeffrey. Yes. That was, that was a, like a very Yeah, I'd be in class, class and I'd be in class and literally, I mean, it'd be like Giovanni Ribisi and it would be doing a yeah. scene. Burt Reynolds would be over there. I mean, <laughs> I Neil heard, Simon, it was crazy. I heard Jim Carrey recently. You know, he doesn't do a lot of interviews, a lot of press. He, he has that show on Showtime right now, I'm yeah. Dying Up Here, which I love. Yes, yes. Love it. I saw the first one. It was great. It's great. Mm-hmm. Um, but he did an interview on Howard Stern, which I'm like, dang. And, you know, Jim Carrey to me, man, mm-hmm. that's that's it. Yep. And he was talking about on there just his whole process through at the comedy store and how he quit doing impressions and um, just his whole process. And he was saying... To your point, he you know you take whatever a year off you read. He likes it, especially where he's at now. Wants two years off. He takes two years off. Wants to just get out of things, kind of focus on read and just travel, yeah. and then jump back into it. Mm-hmm. He says, "I I got to reset now. I got to reset." It's really important, I think. Yeah. Right? That's why traveling, yeah. all that stuff is important. Well, you of, get stuck in a groove, yeah. and it's hard. I mean, the people that we like, like say, like Neil Young. They just reinvent themselves. They come at things from new angles, and so you could repeat yourself your whole, whole life. But in order to switch gears, you do need to have some perspective and to stop and go. You know, what am I doing? And am I stuck in a box with what I'm doing? Like yeah. I said, wouldn't define me. And like I just saw Paul Feig signed to do this thriller with Blake Lively, Good and I thought, him. yeah, that's that's what you have to do at some point to shake it up. Yeah, that was yeah, an because- interesting moment though with Jeffrey and acting class and there's a whole era of of that yeah. of those classes that's that was very influential. But they I don't really know that much about that that connection between Scientology and acting. I don't think there's there a huge is one, connection, Judd. right? I, I I was that no, I don't. I I I so I spent 10 years there and I and I and I, you know, having done, I was around Scientologists yeah. a lot. Yeah. Kirstie Alley, I did her yeah. show, and oh, so and, right. yeah, we shot at the Scientology She's super Center. Into it, right? Yeah, and so uh, for me, I was just way too yeah. developed, and I, I was uh, too old to even get yeah. kind of be sucked <laughs> into that. I mean, yeah. I just, you know, but um, and I don't begrudge it. I, I saw a lot of, I knew a lot of quote unquote Scientologists, yeah. if you want to call them that. Who were great people and yeah. well adjusted, very talented and stuff. Some of whom had grown up in the church, but I I, I think that that was a a factor of the the act, active recruitment by the yeah. church before they were sort of exposed by the internet. But yeah. it was sort of like you know where where celebrity was considered by Ron L, L. Ron Hubbard to be something to be coveted, something yes. to be sort of get, gotten close to, and mm-hmm. celebrities and actors were held in high regard by him. They said for Tom Cruise reason. was like a god there. Like well, they Tom said, it, was they also, said Scientology was great yeah. if you're Tom Cruise. Yes. For everyone mm-hmm. else is a bit of a beast. Yeah, and well, there are a lot of stories yeah. like that. But my experience with it, it was never negative. I just yeah. didn't wasn't going to be involved in it. And the yeah. people that I knew that were Scientologists, from mm-hmm. Jenna Elfman to yeah. you know Jen Aspen, my other friend, or they were all talented, really great people. They they just yeah. happen to have been into this philosophy yeah. as young people that yeah. worked for them. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, um, I did a I did a benefit for 9-11 mm-hmm. at the Scientology Center. Yeah. I emceed it and got up and started telling basically kind of dirty jokes. I was pretending to be an Israeli porn star. And I was like, I think here's <laughs> to they my laugh? bed. I make her to my bed. I make nice <laughs> like that. And it was springtime for Hitler. They were all like it got really quiet <laughs> and a bunch of them came up and go, it's a church. You can't do that. They were really nice about it. And so I, I went out and I apologized. I was like, sorry. And you know what killed is I said, it was a whole church full of Scientologists. And I went, I got to tell you, uh, when I said yes to doing this um, thing, all my friends said at the Scientology center, I said, yeah. And they all said, be careful. 
And everybody kind of laughs. And I said, I know they might tie me to a chair and make me take responsibility for myself. <laughs> you went and the whole place went, yeah. They were like, they loved it. Whoa! You know, anyway, I could do no wrong after that. But it was, it was, I had a lot of interesting experiences, but I don't think that it lends itself yeah. the long point. I don't think that Scientology yeah. made better actors out of people. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's interesting because I'm a self help freak. You know, you I really How like, so? I just like, I'm always reading something like it's this. It's amazing. This is an old Wayne Dyer Read book. it, read you it. Know, um, this is my favorite like relationship guy, uh, John Wellwood, Wood. John Wellwood, Journey to the Judd Heart. Apatow, reading uh, books like this. That's it, amazing. And I, I actually think it helps for writing because it's all about psychology and mm-hmm. motivations and why people do things. But I, I certainly hoard self-help advice and then i think it becomes a soup in my head and i drown in it and i can't get anything done really <laughs> but you're, you're so but that's not that. true because you're so highly effective <laughs> like I, you're yeah. you're as successful as it gets mm-hmm. in show business right <laughs> let me say that one more time just, can we track how many just, times brian said but it, that but it's just it's awkward for me no but it's it's just true. <laughs> it has to be uh, you it's all you, i know but it's just i feel true. bad about myself our <laughs> listeners are doing good we're gonna get roasted no, for it no we're i not. should be happier no no, no, no but, but the reason I keep re- reiterating that is because, like, I always when I look at you, I think mm-hmm. of the there's like this sort of end game, right? Mm-hmm. So in a way, you're at the finish line. I mean, yes. I'm just saying if you we look at it, yeah, I've been in the business for twenty fucking three years. I, I know the difference. Yes. I mean, I can see it. So I'm up there with Merv. <laughs> Correct, you're up there with Merv. <laughs> you're, you're a mogul. But then what cracks me up is you're reading. You know, <laughs> yes. well, like, I think we're all what, mentally. What are you going to learn there? We're all mentally hanging by a thread. I yeah, think, I don't. Most I, of did the you time. expect when we come in like made it? What's up, bitches? Well, here's a bars of gold. No, who needs cash? I just think the discussion lies in that yeah. space where it's like, okay, made it right on yes. paper. Yet you feel like you're there's so much work to be done. That's why it cracks me up when I see you with your notebook yes. after doing a set, and you're literally. You're you're walking. You look like a you look like one of those nerds from school with your books. Like exactly. I want to push you into the I want to push you into the, like That's the how wall. I feel. And I'm, you're like, I'm not this. saying this to make this awkward. Right. I expect that out of you. Like when I saw you at the mm-hmm. comedy store, you're writing. I uh, I've been sad yeah. if you weren't doing that. Like when I yeah. see Joe Rogan, he's recording every set. I expect that out of those guys. When I see Bill Burr going, you better be fucking two hours, three hours a day writing. I expect that out of you guys. If I if you came in here and you're the slob, you're 30 minutes late. It would have broke my heart, man. It would have broke my heart. Well, I remember when Louis was getting ready for this big t- tour he did last year, and, and there's a whole bunch of nights he came in to the comedy store, and they would announce it last second, it would sell out immediately, and I opened up for him on one of those shows, and I and I just thought this guy's working so hard on this, he cares so much he's yeah. doing so many shows to get ready for this tour and then sure. then you see what it turns into it's like kevin hart ever. kevin hart you know he's a new yeah. special he's getting ready to come out and he's been in the valley and he'll announce it that day then he does four or five shows the small room yep. back yeah. back to back and to me like especially this day and age it's tough to find inspiration it's tough to yeah. find role models you know because yeah. a lot of people don't talk about that so you got the way you're gonna get inspired is by seeing these guys do it so when I see, you know, Kevin Hart, who's doing six shows in a night, getting ready for a special, and you want to talk about someone who's made it, yeah. but that's what you expect out of him, you know? To sure. me, that's so cool to see. Six shows in a night. Nuts. But are they, that's crazy. <laughs> I don't know about that, but yeah. Nuts. Yeah, but are they, are they reading self-help? I love that you're reading Well, Kevin self-help Hart wrote stuff. a self-help book. He has a new book. And I read it. Yeah, it's basically a, a self-help mm-hmm. book. It's, yeah. it's advice from Kevin, and he is a beast. He, he was like that. I mean, I did a, a pilot with him. In the year 2000, I, I as soon as he moved to LA, his manager Dave Becky said, "Oh, you got to know Kevin." I love Dave. And he was a kid. We did a, a pilot together. It was him uh, as a you know young wannabe actor comedian, and Jason Siegel as a young wannabe actor, I and love Amy Poehler as a young wannabe actress living in the Valley. It was called yeah. North Hollywood, and I'm so January old. Jones was in it. Was that ABC? And it, and it was ABC. And then I just, remember when it, Amy got that, I, it, and it didn't get picked up. Yeah. And 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 the joke of the whole episode, the whole show was it was a young Kevin Hart who kept talking about how giant he was going to be, and he kept the, that was his joke. Was thing. Yeah. He's like he's like I'm going to be like Chris Tucker, except you can't understand him. He talks too fast, but me, you can understand me. So I'm going to be bigger than Chris Tucker because you can understand me. You can't understand him. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, it didn't go, and so we put him on Undeclared. He did a bunch of episodes of Undeclared, and he was in the Forty Old Virgin. That was what. That's where. And I, yeah, I always thought this guy's the funniest, but I couldn't crack, like, I just couldn't get the show picked up, or I couldn't get the project going. And so it's amazing to see how hard that guy worked, 
oh. to to make it still happen. successful tour of all time. Still, still. and he is funny and a as great hell. guy, and everybody loves him in the room. Like he comes in and makes the room better. Did you? Did you? Yeah. Could you notice something special about him, Judd? Because I'm sure you see. I wasn't sure. I can't say I yeah. thought this guy was going to be the biggest comedian in the world. What I thought was. This guy makes me laugh yeah. my ass so off. So funny, and he should so be, he should be a star. Yes. But he's you never always know. he's I, always funny. But even then, he was like friends with Jay Z, and he had a sense that he had to be good at business. Yeah, even as a young uh, kid, he used to talk about his clothes, and he would take out his clothes, and he had very thoughtfully bought all these clothes, and he would take out like a, a shirt and a pair of pants, and he would call it his set. He's like, "You like that set? You like that set? Like it's a set of clothes. I love it. And we it. would laugh about it because he was acting like a superstar yeah. as a basically unemployed young yeah. person. Yep. But uh, he, re- you know, it, it, especially like you know, like this book was the Power of Intention by Wayne Dyer. The whole book is about setting goals and how you create a certain mental environment to make them happen. That's all Kevin Hart did sure. purely on instincts. There's a technique yeah. to organizing your mind, right? I mean, yes, to, to believe in yourself. And you still f- you feel like you still have to do that. Like I, this, is what I oh, I just sure. like asking these questions because I I, I I I'm always fascinated with the fact that success is a verb; it's not a yeah. noun. Well, you know? my critical voice wants me to stop. It wants you to stop. You know, I've got that voice in my head that's just shut the fuck up. Really, no one cares, and I'm always at war with a part of my brain that is very low self-esteem. It's not all of my brain. It's just one part of it. Well, don't you think most comics have that? I I do. I think it drives all of us. I think we're, we're, we're constantly trying to prove that we deserve to be up there, that our work is valuable. And maybe you couldn't do the work if you didn't have it, but man, it does not go away. And as you get into each stage of life, it, 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 turns into something slightly different but it's coming at it's you there. i said that the other day i said you know you're always told you have to love yourself and it's really important to believe in yourself and i disagree i i think that what drives me is always this sense of inadequacy and uh, sort of like i have a hole i can't fill and i don't i don't like i've never liked myself that much i was i look in the mirror all the time I'm always looking for something to change something yeah. better something to kind of improve i still believe i'm going to be uh, if I keep, if I really apply myself and do more incline bench, I'm going to be, I'm going <laughs> to be 50? as muscular as you are. Wait, it never bench goes is away. Incline? Yeah, dude. Well, <laughs> I, you come to my garage, we'll work out. I'll spot you. I'll spot you. I'm going to get that dad body. Yeah, yeah. Get the dad need. body going. Fuck yeah. Uh, but yeah, you do have to uh, believe in yourself, and then, but your self hatred is what makes you funny. Yeah. Well, your characters, you always start with these like very sort of sensitive characters. Like a lot of the characters in your movies are not guys that are benching 400 pounds or can beat the shit out of everybody in a the bar. They're, yeah. in fact, the exact opposite. They're these vulnerable... People would say nerds. Yeah, Like, like people say, and it's, it's, it's due to your credit, especially this day in Hollywood, they say nerds run Hollywood. I even think, I, like I saw Wonder Woman the other day. I even think they made a point of making her a nerd. Mm-hmm. That, that was part of it, that she's you know, all-powerful, but also weird with the guy she likes and she's you know, she doesn't fit she's in in the yeah. city and i think that every, you know the truth is i think everyone feels that way some people can overcome it to a certain extent you know that's why it's always like funny when i forgot who i was talking about this with but you know when you're like with people who are um, who are amazing like lebron james and and they've mastered a way to get in flow mm. in in their uh, athletics, just to get in a, a zone, a, a, yeah. a zone where they're not doubting themselves. Yeah. We were talking about Federer the other day. You know, this guy just doesn't make an unforced error for hours. And if you've ever played tennis, how hard that is. Yeah. And and I think for comedy, you can get in that space where you forget and you hit some gear where you're not doubting yourself and you're just connecting to some creative uh, pipe in the universe. And that's where you want to get, but man, it is—it's a tough place to to go if uh, you have damage. Yeah, you know, if you have like normal childhood psychic damage. Yeah, to to like yourself enough to let go of your insecurity, to let your brain do what it has to do. But maybe that's good. I, I don't know. I don't think I know really too many comics that are that happy with themselves and just uber confident. Yeah, I don't think you like can real be. cocky. It's, it's not going to work. No, it's so weird to. The Even first Burr, thing. I just did a panel with Bill Burr yeah. for Netflix. It's all these like you know comedy showrunners. Burr, it's in front of like two hundred people. Couldn't kill harder. Oh, my and the God. second oh, it ends, he's just like, 
Ah, those people hate me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I'm up there going, I'm so unfunny. Look how funny Burr oh, is. Yeah. And he's walking off going, yeah, that wasn't good. Yeah. I remember he did, we did the ice house and he was like, ah. and I go, what? He goes, just this time of my, you know, I'm, I'm starting new stuff. It's always so dicey. It's like, Bill, you just fucking destroyed. <laughs> like, like there's nothing left. They had to bring ambulance stuff to bring people <laughs> and bring them out on stretchers from laughter. And I'm always like, amazed at his energy on stage. I did a Largo with him a few months back. He just has the most focused, intense energy. Yeah. He is not half-assing. It. Intense. It's, He's never lost his outrage. It's so Bill committed. Burr always has outrage, generally, yeah. at the world. There's like this angry intensity yeah. about it. It's him. an outrage. I've it's- never laughed so hard at a comedian. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're on the same bill at the comedy store. I got done. I'm like, I got to see Burr, man. So I went in the crowd and just stood in the back. I was laughing so hard. I had tears coming out of my yeah. eyes, man. Yeah. It's, a, it's, pretty, it's remarkable because it's also just... Uh, discipline to get in a headspace to care that much. Yeah, because sure. you could walk through it. So especially easily. as you make money and you're, you know, yeah. you have celebrity and you're flying first class or whatever yeah. it is. You know, he's got, he's doing very well. He's like our Beyonce. <laughs> yeah. Like when you watch Beyonce, a Boston <laughs> pale Beyonce. He's <laughs> got one wasted movement. Like you watch her. Like I saw her in concert. I, I, it's memorizing. There's so much choreography. And and she's singing that I thought, how can you remember more than four songs worth of choreography? Crazy. Yeah. There's thousands of moves here. Yeah. Uh, she a, a hair went in her mouth for a minute and she went and she like Not she happy. made it into like part of the dance. Yeah. And it's so focused yeah. and confident. And yeah, that's a, that's what I always think of. Burr's like a Burr. flat ass Beyonce. Yeah, I don't think of a white <laughs> hey, hey, Judd, that, that's a stretch. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> that of, is a when stretch. I watch Burr, I don't think of Beyonce, but I get what you're saying, sort of. Like it's her human. ass, but the exact they're both, opposite. They're both human. It's a they're, flat they're members of the human ass. race. You know what? Yeah, yeah. I meant he's our, uh, like our Kendrick no, Lamar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that's what you meant. Who's, who, I couldn't believe how short he how small he was, Kendrick. We were doing that uh, the spike thing. Also. Brilliant, that brilliant artist. Did you do a thing with him? No, we we were, we were just at, the at the Spike, spike Awards, and, and he, was he came out and uh, I didn't know who he was. I told Brian went, "That's the greatest uh, hip hop artist on earth right now." And Brian goes, "That little guy went. Yeah. Would you want know. LeBron six eight? Like yeah. why? Why does he got to be a big guy? I He's brilliant." I, I don't know about rap. I just assume rappers were huge guys. Uh, <laughs> in your head, all rappers are seven feet tall. They're seven feet tall. They're all big guys. <laughs> in my, but they're in just my... like I think they're just like comics in the sense that it, they're poets. They're trying to express themselves. They're nerds. I mean, you know, you you bet that probably fit into how you become 100%. that person who has to express yourself that way. At some point, yes. you know, at some point, Kendrick Lamar was uh, you know avoiding a beating and his talent uh, yeah. you know, defined him. So you're like, oh, I'm not going to beat up that guy. I like that guy. Dre Dre was in his basement. He wasn't out hanging out. Cube was the same. Same way they would like, yeah. they were literally in their basement <clears throat> creating stuff. Yeah. They were not out banging. No people. Yeah. People don't see the people don't, don't say banging, but people don't see <laughs> street guys don't ever say banging guys, ever in your sorry, fifty year old street. life again. It, it, it's gang never banging, say when banging you're in the ever like me, again. In your street, you say banging. No, but because people, you know, Kendrick Lamar and the Ice Cube and the game, like those guys are artists, man. They just yeah. come yeah. from that rough life. But people don't look at them like you know. It's a weird. Con- Comparison can't get any weirder than Beyonce and Bill Burr, but you know, Ke- like Kendrick Lamar uh, is you know the same artist or small guy as like a Seth Rogen. You know, he just Seth Rogen comes from this nerdy what is he Canadian? Yeah, you know, and then Kendrick Lamar is that nerdy yeah. black kid, yeah. but they don't make that. Even Tupac, I think, came from somewhat of a mellow. Well, environment. he went to Tupac went to Juilliard, um, right? School for the arts. No, it was yeah. I think it was in Baltimore somewhere. Yeah. But he went, he went to. I'm, uh, I'm almost positive he went to Juilliard. Did he go for to acting. Juilliard? But wow. are you saying that, uh, that you might have to that, look that up, Jen? That yeah. rap music is completely off your radar. Me? Yeah. No, not completely. Off you listen radar. to it? Uh, I do. I mean, uh, uh, your kids uh, do. It's, my kids do. So there's a lot in my world for the last uh, whatever 14 years. I I remember listening to the Dr. Dre record. The Chronic was probably the first record that we really listened to. Yeah. I don't find it that relaxing to just have playing because my no. my ear goes to the lyric. So if you're, I'm just sitting around the house, I don't like. It's like having someone talking in my ear. Gotcha. I like it in the car with the kids, and I also like how much they like it. Yeah, you know. But then sometimes it's so dirty. Like talking about hoes. Yeah, I'll be like in the car dicks. with my daughters, and it's like 
it's as filthy as a human can speak. And I'm trying to be like, cool, dad. Like, hmm, this is a nice number. <laughs> you know, you don't want to shut it off and be cool like, cool, be here, dad. kids. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this uh, yeah. wordplay <laughs> about the vagina. Right. <laughs> I hit the pussy from behind, motherfucker. Yeah, right, well. And the kids don't seem to care. It's funny. I don't think they hear the lyrics. I don't think that they're shocked by anything because I don't, I was trying to remember like when I like knew about certain phrases or certain sexual things as a kid and they find out everything so early, but don't seem thrown by it. Yeah. It's just, Nor do they what, what do you think of this whole politically correct mania? This, I think it's pretty out of control. I felt yeah. bad for, for Kathy Griffin. I, 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 I think it was a mistake. Yeah. Uh, poor I, taste. I, uh, uh yeah, I think it's pretty. I think it's it's an error in judgment, but not important. Yeah, I think she's you're not, not a bad human being. She, she's important. amazing. She's great, and she's hysterical and a nice person. And I think as a result of her frustration, she did something that she shouldn't have done. But I think it's it's nothing that anyone should care about. Five minutes after, yeah, it's just a, it's just you well, know about- if you've ever done photo shoots as you guys have, right? Mm-hmm. People are always handing you props, you know, like like when we did a, a knocked up. Everyone wants Seth dressed up like a baby. You know, he shows up at the photographer's <laughs> studio. Everyone's trying to get him in a diaper or put him in a giant crib, and that is what happens. And so, if you're doing a photo shoot and someone's like, "Hey, why don't you hold this bloody head?" If you are tired. <laughs> Or you're you just, just to get out of there? In, in a mood or whatever. You, or yeah. you just saw something in the news that bugged you. There might be a moment where you're like, that sounds funny. Yeah. And you had a moment. And you and you miss it. And I think that's what we're supposed to do as comedians. But don't you think after, like, so she, and I agree with you, maybe like, hey, do this. And she's like, check it out. Well, ha, ha, ha. But, you know, she's she has to okay those photos. Like, she knew, like, the she, magnitude of that. judgment for sure. Yeah, and I think that Her what team, happens too. is... Yeah, I saw her apology. You know, when she put her first apology up, and I thought, yeah, that's right. You yeah, just, for sure, we're it's a makeup, bad joke. Yeah. Comedians are supposed to make bad jokes. We're supposed to find the line of taste and event. And the only way we know what we're doing is that we we cross it here yeah, and there, the line. and that's what we're here for. And when someone makes a mistake, no comedic error in judgment should affect your career. Right. I, I think she's going to bounce back and be fine. Oh, I think that the, her crowd loves her. It will it, in a year. Yeah. It'll it'll That's only make said. her it'll more her popular. Rock. Like she lost the CNN job. What she worked, people don't realize like she lost the CNN job. She worked one night New Year's. She's not part it's of also CNN. Probably really. the best thing in a way. I mean, you're right. I think it's going to just you know make because her, her crowd's going to unsung I, hero. What's going to happen? It's going to go down, and then any publicity is good publicity, and then it's going to roll back yeah. in her favor. I think. Yeah. But it's, but I think as a result of everyone's tension about Trump because even the people who like Trump quietly are going like is he crazy like mm-hmm. like is this a sane guy making choices mm-hmm. is he smart does he understand what happens when you engage yeah. you yeah. know fighter jets over Syria even his own mm-hmm. staff i think are are always uh, they don't know what he's going to do like yeah. is he listening to the last guy he spoke to? See, I think everyone's on eggshells, but at the same time, even as a comic, she she would know this. In the side we live in with ISIS and the way they traumatize everyone, the way they yeah. scare everyone is by these beheadings. Yeah. And you do that. I, maybe you fucking hate Trump. I don't yeah, care yeah. what your take is on yeah. it. But the headless Trump it's very real. Blood, it's very real. Man, yeah, because that's real. a legit problem sure. we have today. Oh sure, and yeah. I think that that's. You know, and I think she understands that. So then the question becomes something different, which is, do we forgive comedians for making mistakes? And I think in a very stressful environment where everyone is stressed, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you're stressed just by the fact that everyone's disagreeing. Yeah. Comedians are trying to figure out how to comment about this and are making mistakes here and there. And I think that they should be forgiven because... But we don't forgive regular people. And one of the things that I'm noticing is that the work environment mm-hmm. and and the media is very unforgiving, and I think that people we're lose diluting, their jobs. Well, like so, there. So in at Uber, one of the board members, not the CEO, yeah. but the board member, turned to Ariana Huffington because they were talking about getting more women on the board. Yes. and he turned to Ariana Huffington and said, "Well, one thing's for sure, it'll be a lot more talkative around here, or yeah. something to that ex- mm-hmm. extent." And he had to resign because the speech, resign? yeah, the speech police were all over him. And yeah. to me, that's a funny comment. And if yeah. you're that insecure about your movement or whatever's happening, and you see this in, in, in academia, I mean, you know, you've got you've got certain professors that are like this one Rogan had a professor on who was a biology professor, and I guess he refused to stay home. They wanted to have um, 
sort of all white people would stay home that day and only people of color could come to the co- yeah. some to some demonstration or to to to, to college yeah. in sort of commemoration and he was like I'm not doing that I'm a teacher I'm white but I'm not I don't identify that way yeah. and so he was being called a racist and all that yeah. and I, I think that I think that academia has just lost its mind I, I think so and I, I hear a lot about it you know uh, just uh, hearing about it from kids who are college age now yeah, yeah. and uh, it's you know it's it's funny because I remember Joan Rivers was always a n- no apology person yeah, and she said the worst things ever. But her theory was, I will never apologize for anything. And she survived uh, yeah. and thrived as a result. And of I feel like that's Don the Rickles way to go. That way too. Rickles, I feel like that's the way to yeah. go. I it really is. do. I feel like people, even if you're wrong, if you stand by it, at least yeah. you draw a line in the stand. People are like, well, at least, at least we know where he stands. If you tell the truth too, right? I mean, isn't the truth like so? As a writer, as somebody who's kind of like coming up with these stories, do you find you have to check yourself? Because so much of this is about the truth. Well, like, I'm aware right now yeah. that people are paying attention to how I frame these things. So I, I, I'm, I, you know, I think Colin Quinn said the best thing. He said, you, "There's no problem with any of this. Just mean what you say." Yeah, mm. it's it, a lot of it is th- when you're thoughtless, you get in trouble yeah. when you can't back up your opinions, but. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy political correctness. Someone from Saturday Night Live made a joke about Trump's son and and got fired. Oh, and I, I I feel like there, you know, if you got a lifetime of of comedy and good hearted work, and you 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 make a verbal mistake, yeah. I, I think you should have the opportunity to discuss it. But no one's careers. Well, that's what well, I look mean, at Bill but, Bill Maher, right? right? Yeah. He said uh, he goes, "Oh no, I'm not a house ninja." Right? He used the N word. Yes. Which that's that's a tough that's go a as tough a white guy, yeah. but you can see the, but there's a lot of that. There's a is, there's a context, but it, in the context he was doing it, it when you watch it, I'm not I'm not advocating this at all. It's not right. okay that he did that. When you watch him, like he shouldn't lose his job over that, right? Man. And that's what I feel like. There's there's a group of people that aren't interested in persuasion or changing the world or changing mm. anybody's mind. Yeah. What what I feel like a lot of the speech police and a lot of the politically correct the the sort of social justice yeah. warriors are more interested in is punishment. Yeah. And power. And so when they'll so when they'll come after your job, I mean, they'll, like you're talking about your career and your reputation, two things yeah. that take a lifetime to build. It's almost and, a form of they, bullying, isn't it? It's, it's not only yeah. but it's also a form of destruction and murder because it's almost like they're almost like I always feel like they're poachers, but at least poachers take something from the body. I mean, yeah. these people come along, they go, oh, you said one bad thing. We're going to brand you a homophobe, a sexist and a racist. Define We're going to also we, we demand that you resign so that you don't have a job anymore. We're going to ruin your reputation. Let's move on to the next guy. But we didn't change anybody's mind. What we did is punish that guy. I don't know. We're going to make the world a better place by censoring that old white CEO, yeah. for example, Roger Ailes, who might have been an asshole. I don't know. But yeah. the point is, is that I don't think that that is the best way to – If provided you're trying to make the world a better place and change minds. I don't know that that kind of censorship, that kind of coordinated attack yeah. – Remember Alec Baldwin called that photographer a cocksucker, yeah. and they were calling him a homophobe. Yeah. Alec Baldwin's a, That's a great word. He, he's also yeah. Don't take that word away from me. Fuck you. I'm guys. keeping <laughs> cocksucker. Fuck you. I'm guys. keeping the cocksucker. So am I. Yeah. Fucking, I'll use that my whole life. I get mad when they. How dare you try to take that it word? It also away implies from me. that we think that that's not a positive thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> why would that be bad? Correct. <laughs> Especially if you got a wig on. As we finish up, I'm going to call my Uber, and then I'm going to walk out of here directly into Judd an Uber. takes an Uber <laughs> directly chopper. Directly Uber. Uber chopper. Yeah. And uh, well, I got rid of uh, my car, and then I, I, I just why'd you get rid of I your didn't car? Replace it. It just I I, I had this Lexus uh, hybrid from the ninety. Yeah. I got it. Hey. No, no, two thousand eight, and uh, I could tell it was done. <laughs> so, Judd, but then I Judd, didn't replace it. Get a fucking chauffeur. You're you're way too rich to be. No, don't get a chauffeur. Don't be that. Get guy. a Bentley. Chauffeur, is that what get they a, call them? Now? Get a Bentley <laughs> chauffeur. Hire like celebrities to drive you around periodically. Out of work, like Bruce you Wayne, have the money man. for it. Um, you're not a car guy, so you just don't I'm have not a car. A big car guy. I, I I like I like a good car, but I'm not like I'll get my muscle. He's car. literally like calling I, an Uber as we speak. I have to. I uh, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going though, so this is uh, I don't have all the information. Oh. Uh, and I don't even know wh- exactly where I am. You're down in, uh, down I, near the beach. You know, I uh, okay. Mm. There I am. I'm going to. Uh, yeah, we can. Count. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll so just close the show. Let's yeah. close the show. Let's out, plug man. your dates and then plug okay. your dates and let's wrap close this, this thing. I have a, a real appointment after this. Like one of those medical things you can't uh, you can't miss. Oh yeah. I mean, this is not like a lateness. Uh, What's your medical thing? thing? 
Uh, nothing bad. You're right, just, uh, just getting a couple of limbs removed. There you go. <laughs> Um, Study your brain. This was fun. Thanks for doing this, brother. I enjoyed every really, second of it. Really yeah, man, appreciate it was great. you coming out, man. Really, this really appreciate it, man. Yeah. So Thanks. you're gonna be at the Wilbur running your special. Let me Boston. let me actually tell you the exact date. Let's so hear I, it all. I feel like I've been bad plugging because I don't know when anything is. Because you don't like self promotion or cars. I just or I'm clothing. Just, it's, it's all just disorganized. But okay, ready? This will. This is the actual information. Judd Apatow. We can schedule. get it where? Okay, the Wilbur. Uh, which is uh, Monday, July 24th, two shows. Second show is for charity. Uh, and then the, the day before that, the 23rd, I'm at, in Ridgefield, Connecticut Ooh. at the Ridgefield Playhouse. And then I am in Providence, Rhode Island on the 25th at the Columbus Theater. Damn. Boom. And then I'm in Montreal. There's still some tickets left, I think. I'll it, see you in Montreal. Just for laughs. Yeah. Just and the like, Big Sick. Go see the Big Sick if you want to see a good movie, if you yeah. like that. Go see the Big Sick. in theaters bastard. everywhere? That'll be uh, New York and L.A. Uh, the next two weeks, and then everywhere uh, July 14th. Boom. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on, man. Really yes, appreciate Chad it. Chad Apatow. Pleasure. Congrats on all your success, Chad. Thank you. <laughs> my Merv like success. Chad Apatow. One of my faves, man. What a good time. Smart dude. Yeah, man. I want, I want the audience to chalk up how many times you said successful. He, I, I, but he, it, what fascinates me is that he's successful, but so down to earth and so hungry. And I just get a kick out of somebody who, because the reason I say that is because I've been trying to write for a long time in earnest. Like I've been trying. I mean, maybe I'm not a writer at the end of the day, <laughs> honestly. But you it's not made just, a fifty. It's not, it's not just that. It's like I have so many friends being here in 23 years. So you have to take this in my history into account. And I, I start. I came here in 1995. If I told you how many people I know who went to theater sc- the film school and who spent a lifetime trying to write just one movie, how yeah. many writers I know who, who spent a lifetime trying to get one movie made, like, I mean, so many people, right? I mean, so many. And I think I know maybe three people that have done it and they've done it in moderately successfully. And then you see a guy like that who's been doing it over and over again. Movies, to, in my view, are so good like every movie, like I love you, man. Super bad. I mean, every movie he touches is is fucking amazing. Really I don't know, but so prolific that it's actually mind blowing to me that he's yeah. that good at what he does. Like it's mind blowing. Like I'm not impressed with comedians. So comedians, like we talk about all these comedians, I love them. They're all great. Yeah, but it's not a mystery to me. Mm. I guess with Judd, what he does is a mystery. Like it's a mystery that he's that good at what he does. Because writing a movie, I, no, I agree with all this. All I'm just saying so, we don't so, have to keep so reminding him me, how successful. So for me, he was. it wasn't about reminding him how successful he was. He knows how it was. What I was trying to get at was just the fact that the guy is like, what is his process? Like, how is it that he does this? And also, it's obvious. Part of it's just the fact that he has that feeling of so not it's being, talent. Not hey, being. Good I, I think a lot of people can't chalk it up. Like a lot of people just don't have the brain that Judd Apatow does. Yeah. You're yeah. just not as far. It's same with sports. Same with actors, it's comedians. True. You just don't have the talent. You just don't have the talent. You want the mystery? Talent plays. You were born with it. Yeah. We're not all created equal. No. We don't all start at the same starting line. Correct. No matter how many books you read, you would never be. Says. You would never be the writer Judd Apatow. Your right. friends will never be Judd Apatow. I will never be Judd Apatow. Yeah. And neither will I. There's no mystery there. Which is why I'm. What I want to take this this moment to say that I'm quitting the business because <laughs> Judd Apatow. <laughs> Uh, Quentin Bishop. He's a good dude. I definitely want to see that movie. Any movie he does, right? Yeah, any movie he does. Well, I've been, I've been like that show crashing. Man. Like, I like Pete Holmes. I can't really relate to Pete Holmes. He's a little too beta for me, right? Like, when he's on the show, I was just like, ah. Like, I wouldn't hang out with Pete at a bar. But I like Pete. I like his opinion. I think he's funny. Oh, it's just special. He's very funny. So I can relate to that. But I was like, I'm not crazy. You know, it's just not my type of dude. He's not my circle. And I watch Crashing. He's hilarious. I yeah. fucking Pete's, Pete's, love the show. Pete's Dove's in Crashing, by the way. Yeah, I know. Dove's the, the he's, great. he's the comedy uh, store owner. It's yep. hilarious. Yep. It's fucking great. I know. But yeah, man. Judd Apatow. Yeah. Judd Apatow. That's a, now I feel like, now that we got Judd, I feel like we should be getting Arnold Schwarzenegger, Frank's. I mean Sylvester Stallone. Who who's the guy you want to get on? I want to get I want to get Kevin Hart on. I don't know, man. We should keep on keeping on. There's no one I really want. Yeah, I, it's fun. The show, the show is me. the show is you and could me. care less. Yeah, yeah. I mean he's good, but I don't. Yeah, that's guess, not what makes the just show. Don't break it real for quick. Me. Uh, since Judd mentioned um, Superwoman, yeah, or not Superwoman, Wonder, Wonder, Wonder Woman. Woman, yeah. 
uh, since we're just we didn't do current events, just one. She's making three hundred thousand per movie. There's like three movies she signed on for three hundred thousand. Who uh, a Gal Gal Gadot? Yeah. yeah. Well, they lock you in. Uh, we 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 can get. Uh, I talked to Patty about getting Gal and and her and Patty on the podcast. Sweet. So I think we can do that. That'll be fun. Yeah, they they lock you. In. It's like the same with the Lord of the Rings characters. Right? Yeah, you remember that's it, what I thought. He, of he was saying how like. He signed on for those whatever four or five they made, and you think they're balling. He's like, no, no, no. They know this thing's going to be big, yeah. so they get you from this. You but know. I got news for you. I got news for you. In Hollywood, when your movie makes that much money, mm-hmm. you, you, you can renegotiate. Yeah, there she, are a lot of ways. Especially on Even Because so, she's Wonder Woman, so it's going to be tough to make a second one be yeah. as successful without her. Oh, okay. She's like, I'm not doing that watch, shit. Watch this. All you got to do is this. I'm telling you. God, my neck. I got... I don't know how I'm going to shoot on, when are we shooting? I got this, I I don't know, I got hurt last time and I just feel like I don't know. It's not worth it I've to seen, me anymore. I've seen, I've, I have stories of people who, Especially the way she looks, I mean, she yeah. could go on to do whatever the fuck yeah, she wants. I'll be renegotiating. She'll get her money. Yeah, she In fact, her agents, it won't even come to that. Her agents are going to go, hey, listen, obviously, let's uh, let's step up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, the student's out like, of, yeah, you're out right. Out of courtesy. Unless you want, a you'd like find a star. better Wonder Woman. Yeah, she's at it. Well, they're not. Freaking. No, you're. That's that's your Wonder. That's Woman. That's Wonder Woman for the sequel. So hey, hey guys, can we? We're gonna share. Can we, what 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 her beak a little bit? They'll or? figure it out, especially yeah. how much how well it's done. They're not yeah. gonna. You can't I mean, are you surprised that she made three hundred thousand for each film? I thought that was even for her. Too. Uh, low. You know what? I am. That's pretty low. Oh, it's very low. That's yeah. crazy low. But she's an unknown actress. Yeah, well, she this. was in the, the Fast and Furious movies. I'm going to say it again. She's an unknown actress. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So, like, for her, this is her big break. You're so right. the, the film should get after this, probably what she's thinking. 300 grand. I, I'm the star of Wonder Woman, this huge budget. Yeah. You're going to do whatever it takes. Yeah. I mean, Patty didn't get locked down. Most people do it for free. For the second one. So she's going to be able to renegotiate, sure. make some money. But they always do that. They're, they're smart. You know, people smart. They know they're doing. They're like, and then, you know, you know how it is. It's like the UFC. It's like, you're not the UFC. You're a part of this thing, you know. The, the the movie is the is the star, so depending. But when you get when you have that's, an opening, that's a little weird. Yeah, not really. Cause well, because like Tom Cruise, like Tom Cruise, well, well, Tom Cruise is different. If, if you're if you're Iron Man, man, yeah, yeah, it's a little different. No, that's again, again, if you separate yourself as an actor, like I can't see anybody being better than Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. Now you're getting fifteen million dollars, right? I mean, that's the way it is. So, I I, I was in the car. When somebody was negotiating uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s money for a movie, and it was pretty mind blowing, ridiculous. When when they were talking about the kind of numbers thrown around, I was like, oh, well. as big as it gets. But man. you know what? He's worth it. Yeah, I go to. I would go to a movie for him. That that's worth. Yeah, a lot. I'm a Robert Downey Jr. fan, man. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, buddy. it's been a fun episode, man. You got a Judd big Aptow. shoot tonight, brother. I do, man. Comedy Central. Comedy Central, like I said, uh, the comedy Shop, store. Who goes from being a UFC heavyweight to now shooting something on Comedy Central? Uh, this ain't happening. I know, man. I'm excited. Have you reflected on that? No, not yet. Not today. I won't. I'm no. just now. Nah, I just want to get it done. done. I'm sure tonight, when I'm in, at home in my undies, I will. Yeah. Or tomorrow, but yeah. right now, I don't want to think about making a bigger deal than it is. <laughs> you going, Chin? I didn't get a. Well, Nobody got an invite. Later. The way they I, I get, get tickets, they're not it, doing though. it. I get it. No, no, no. The, like the they for my fans, they did. Hey, sign up here, you get free tickets. Right. But then they send you like a thing. Yeah, I guess they pick you. They pick whoever out of the people that applied for it. I already had the information early, but whoever applied for it, they'll just email you back if you got the tickets. It's a yeah. some sort I'll of. Say, like I'll send my manager a text and out and have them hit them up so you make sure you get tickets. I don't know what's going on there. If not, we still have you know <laughs> stuff to do here, so probably wouldn't even make it in time. Yeah. If we did more shows. So. Word. Mm. I hear you, man. <laughs> well, boom. And I'll have some more. Like I said, I have more dates coming up soon. They just say, gave me uh, some of the dates. I know. Just going off the top of my head. Salt Lake, Chicago, Detroit, and Denver. Big Brown? Yeah. Right now? That's all I can think of right I'm now. I'm going to be at... Um... I'll be at the Comedy Zone in Charlotte, North Carolina. Get your tickets now at tfatk.com or Comedy Zone in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, July 20, 21, 22. And the only tickets you can get right now that are available for me are in Phoenix, Stand Up Live, and that is July 20th. Phoenix, get your tickets. 
Big Brown Brizake down. Brizake Is that it, down. B? That's it, buddy. This is the Fire Kid with Judd Apatow. We're out. <laughs>